And we are coming up uh, in a very timely moment when um, not only we all know that civic space is creating in Europe and this really uh, contaminating phenomenon from one no country is immune uh, to various degrees and different extents, but also uh, more and more civic space issues become central on the European agenda. Also, thanks to your huge mobilization and our advocacy efforts at the European level. So we brought together uh, both activists from local, regional, national level, EU level uh, organizations and policymakers to discuss and to have important conversations on how uh, can the EU and member states provide a better space for civil society to thrive and to do our uh, everyday mission, which is to give practical substance uh, to the EU and universal values and fundamental rights. Um, I will give the floor in the beginning to Carlotta Begossi, who is coordinator of Civil Society in Europe. I think all of you know uh, by today what is Civil Society Europe, but I think still it is worth to, to say a few words in the beginning and to set the scene um, about the main reasons why we are here today and what we would like to discuss with institutions. Carlotta, the floor is yours. So uh, tell me if you don't, uh, the sound doesn't work correctly. I don't have a very strong voice. Um, so I'm really pleased to, to be here and to, to have had the opportunity to work together uh, with the European Civic Forum and, and Civicos to organize this event. And uh, I, I would like again, on, on behalf of uh, Civil Society Europe, of all its, uh, its members, to, to welcome you. Uh, as uh, so, Civil Society Europe is a coordination uh, for all the four civil society organizations at European uh, uh, Union level. That means that we bring together uh, many uh, platforms who um, are made of uh, many organizations at European and, and national level and work on very different issues uh, from uh, culture, education, social, civic engagement, environment, transparency, and, and many other things, governance, democracy, and so on. And, um, and we do very different things, but the, 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 the reason why we, uh, all these organizations are together is to uh, uh, learn from each other, um, develop, uh, develop things together, but also to have a voice, a common voice uh, for civil uh, society. Also next uh, to other actors in society, like for example, the business or the, or the trade unions on issues that are that are common to all these organizations. And of course, we are open to all other uh, networks and platforms who would like to, to, to join. Um, so why we, we are organizing this uh, this event? Um, you know, like uh, like me, that we, we are going through, through a challenging time. Um, we have, of course, uh, the war at the borders. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, the consequences that we're still not measuring about climate change, but uh, on which we start seeing uh, very worrying uh, signs and, and problems, increased poverty, inequalities, a lot of people are going into exile because of this situation. And, um, and we also have uh, backslash in democracy uh, across the world and also um, and so civil society organizations are relentlessly trying to address all these issues and, and also stepping in sometimes uh, for authorities, public authorities, uh, to solve uh, some of the, of, the, of, the, of the society issues that we face. But despite <laughs> this, despite that, we recognize that we cannot um, in society function without uh, the engagement of people within civil society organizations, civil society organizations. At the same time, we are seeing a deterioration since quite a few years, including in the European Union of, uh, of civic space. And uh, 
today we will hear that in the reports uh, that will be presented, but also through uh, the testimonies, which also present also a positive side uh, there is of resilience, which is interesting to recognize. We also see on a positive trend that uh, uh, we started with the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights uh, issuing reports uh, about challenges and uh, uh, restriction to civil society, of course, uh, following on what has been also already done by the UN in, the, in, this, uh, in this context. And uh, we, uh, last year, we had uh, reports from the European Parliament, we had the, uh, the annual report on the Charter of Fundamental Rights, also addressing uh, these issues. We had the conclusion of the Conference on the Future of Europe also, who looked at, uh, at uh, some of, the, of, uh, of these issues. And, um, and now this year also happy and we'll hear also about that, about the council conclusions on civic space the first time. Um, and in the rule of law also some country, first country specific recommendation also addressing uh, civic space. And all these developments are really promising, but still we miss a, career, a coherent approach. And that's why uh, so many organizations in Europe, at European level, at national level, have called for a civil society strategy. And if we don't have a coherent framework, uh, the risk is that we have on one hand very good recommendations, um, but on the other hand, we have other processes who might create further hurdles to civil society. So we've seen already with the um, anti-money laundering package and legislation, which has a very positive goal, of course, but uh, which introduces measures that are problematic to civil society. Um, we also see in the defense of democracy package very promising uh, issues coming up on civic engagement, but at the same time, uh, we can only be worried about uh, the upcoming directive, uh, and I have to read it because the title is complicated, on common transparencies and accountability standards for interest representation services directed or paid for from outside the EU. Uh, we also see that a lot of, uh, I mean, not a lot, but some um, politicians are surfing on the Qatar gate to actually impose restrictions uh, to civil society and shifting the attention also from necessary reforms in EU institution and in the culture of EU institution as regards transparency and accountability to civil society. So this is um, this is why we wanted to get together. Also, we've had uh, uh, an event in December, which was a very good dialogue. Uh, a very good dialogue started, um, uh, which changed a little bit uh, the paradigm we were used to, uh, because we had really the possibility to discuss and co-create also with um, people working on EU institutions about uh, the future. And so we want to continue on that uh, on that trend, and uh, and really use this meeting uh, to discuss really in. Um, in a very positive uh, way to understand each other's limits, each, other, each other's concerns, and try to really come up uh, with, uh, with a plan for the future that will really uh, protect civil society, and especially as civil society is a fundamental actor in the defense of democracy and is not the the and it's not the tool through the through which democracy is attacked so i well this is as an introduction thank you for thank you carlota for uh, for your introduction I have to apologize because I think I forgot to introduce myself. So, <laughs> I'm Sandrina Naimovic, Secretary General of the European Civil Forum. Um, I will walk you through the day, so and I will be the moderator of one of the panels. I will try to speak as little as possible to give enough room uh, to the next session. So next we have uh, from the organizers um, 
Mariana Belalba, who is joining us remotely, right? I hope it works from Civicus. She's in charge of the Civicus Monitor, which is a huge uh, research and advocacy tool uh, monitoring the state of civic space and civil liberties across 197 countries and territories, publishing an annual report. Uh, this year, we jointly communicated on our uh, annual reports between European Civic Forum and Civicus. So if Mariana is ready and is with us, can somebody confirm that Mariana is with us? Yes, yes. I can hear her voice. Welcome, Mariana. And please, you have the floor to tell us a little bit, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, about global trends, also focusing generally on the EU, uh, what is the situation? Because the novel thing is that this year you unveiled uh, the scoring that is behind your ratings of countries in terms of respective civic space. So please, the floor is yours. We don't see you, if you can. Okay. Can you see my part. screen? Yes, we do see your screen. Please, the floor yeah. is yours. Thank you so much. Let me. Can you see me now? Yes. Yes, we do Great. see you. Thank Great, thank you so much for the invitation. And yeah, it has been a pleasure to collaborate in this event and obviously also in both of the reports who were launched last week. And yeah, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, the findings of people power on their attack, uh, which is basically an assessment of civil space conditions um, at a global uh, level. Uh, but before that, I think, as it was mentioned before, I want to give a little bit of a context of where we at globally. And as it was mentioned, the Civicus Monitor sort of give a portrait of civil space conditions in 197 countries and territories. And what we have been documented is a continued decline of civil space conditions. As you can see from the screen, <clears throat> now the majority of people, almost uh, more than 80% of the world population, live in countries in the three worst categories, either repressed or structured or closed. And this year, we actually saw an increase in the countries that are rated as closed, meaning that we have almost 29% of the world population living in countries where it is almost impossible to exercise the freedom of peaceful assembly, association, and expression. If we go and zoom in a little bit more uh, into the European Union, obviously by comparison, uh, the situation is, is better. As you can see from the map and the color in the map, uh, the European Union does host uh, most of the countries who are rated as either open or narrow. So basically out of the 27 countries of the European Union, <clears throat> 24 of them are rated as open. People more or less are able to exercise this freedom narrow where there is some limitations. And we have three countries rated as obstructed, Hungary, Poland, who were downgraded a, a few years ago. And this year we downgraded Greece. And I will explain in a few minutes a little bit more about that. And finally, I wanted to just speak a bit about uh, the situation in the region. As I mentioned, we downgraded two countries this year, but also upgraded two, the Czech Republic and Latvia. For the downgraded, we have Cyprus, we have seen uh, an increase in restrictions for civil society organizations to register, to open bank accounts, so an increased environment um, uh, where the legal framework doesn't uh, uh, operate in favor of civil society, which has been challenging this in courts. Uh, Greece, the situation is uh, worse. We have actually been documented the uh, criminalization of solidarity, basically civil society organizations who work with refugees or asylum seekers are being criminalized uh, by the authorities. We also have seen the use of unnecessary and excessive force in protests and also the surveillance and harassment of journalists. That's what Greece goes from the narrow to the obstructed category, joining the few countries in the European Union who pose this rating. 
in a slightly more positive news, we also upgraded Latvia and the Czech Republic. Uh, partially these changes are due to changes in leadership. We have been documenting a little bit more of an open space for civil society in these countries. Latvia, for example, we have seen uh, civil society organizations more involved in decision making, in consultation with the government. In the Czech Republic, uh, there is a less confrontational approach from the authorities, and there is a willingness to reform uh, very contagious issues, for example, like the independence of the media in the country. We still obviously have documented, at least in the Czech Republic, some uh, uh, restrictions. Still, there is some vilification by the former prime minister to journalists and civil society organization. As it happened with any open country, there is still some uh, challenge that needs to be overcome, but we see these uh, uh, these countries going into the right direction. I don't think I have time. I will have to hand over to Giada uh, in a few seconds, but from the screen, you also have seen uh, the most common restrictions that we have documented specifically in the European Union, the mirror, uh, uh, the, the ones in the, in the regional chapter of people power under attack, Basically, harassment and intimidation uh, has been the thought violations and the protesters of the day, which is, by the way, one of also the thought violations that we have seen in mostly open and narrow countries since COVID-19 that hasn't changed. Uh, I will hand over to you now and yeah, very uh, open to question if we have time afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here, both uh, at the conference. So <laughs> both uh, here in presence, but also online because we have uh, participants also online. Um, yes, uh, uh, we, the European Civic Forum, just published also our annual Civic Space Report and really confirms the findings that Marianna just highlighted. I wanted to mention some uh, trends that we observed that complement what has been said so far, um, three in particular. First of all, we see uh, a number of laws being passed and implemented in a number of uh, uh, member states that really hamper in different ways uh, civil society organizations work. And uh, what is interesting uh, is that we see with these laws uh, there is a shift from understanding freedom of association and assembly as really a uh, means to ensure social cohesion and democracy to uh, targeting civil society as entities that are presumed guilty and that need to be uh, supervised, uh, restricted, or even sanctioned uh, due to uh, lack of transparency, security, or um, Yes, uh, other issues. It is really worrying to see that some of these narrative that uh, uh, legitimize the measures we see in member states are coming in uh, uh, Brussels in the European uh, Union level as well. Uh, for example, in the context of the Qatar gate. So we really need to oppose that. A second uh, trend is uh, the implementation of civil dialogue and structured participation of civil society in the policy making is still lacking both at the national and European level and really need to be strengthened. And finally, um, we see, um, as Mariana also said, a number of instances of smear campaigns, verbal and physical attacks, legal harassment and criminalization of civil society organizations and activists for their human rights work. So what do we need to do at the European level? What, we, what do we need from uh, European institutions and member states? First of all, uh, it's important to contextualize the shrinking civic space in the backsliding democracy, but also in the context of four decades of policymaking driven by financial capitalism, which increased the inequalities and precarities. So we really need to uh, tackle the fear for the future, the mistrust that many uh, feel toward the institutions with appropriate uh, 
policies. Then we need uh, um, a long-term vision for how to develop uh, the civil society sector at the European level. We need the protection, we need the support. We also need the uh, real, uh, genuine political recognition and engagement in developing European policies. And finally, and we will hear more later, we really need a protection mechanism for a civil society that is under attack uh, to receive direct assistance and uh, diplomatic support from the European institutions. I'm looking forward to hear your ideas about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. What did you do? Mm -hmm. No, no, it's working. It's working, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Jada. Um, you, I, I think you saw on the program, uh, the event is organized through different sessions. Now we will hear some powerful testimonies from some activists on the ground that are working every day and sometimes uh, putting their bodies to defend the democracy in the front line. Uh, we will hear their testimonies and then we will uh, organize the discussion into two panels, one panel dedicated to look at how the rule of law, uh, the annual rule of law cycle in, in the EU can uh, better include um, civic space as, a, as, a, as an issue and provide better uh, recommendations and um, some, some mechanisms for civil society to be better protected. And then in the second panel, we will look at uh, the potential of probably the upcoming defensive democracy pact, but not only to uh, discuss what is needed at the EU level and member states level to protect civil society, enable uh, its constituencies to work every day on the ground. Um, let's start now with the testimonies and, uh, and I will uh, briefly introduce um, we have with us today Justyna Budzinska. I don't think she needs much introduction, unfortunately. Uh, she, she became famous in a few days. Um, her story is really uh, on the first cover of European media, but just to say that she's a Polish activist from the abortion dream team. And just last week, she has been convicted and found guilty of helping abortion in Poland and sentenced to eight months of community service. And this is really a precedent uh, in Europe and he will tell us uh, about the situation. Uh, we have also with us remotely Sean Binder. It's not the first time that we, we have him. He's a human rights campaigner and the founder of Free Humanitarian. And he is currently on trial. It's been some time actually that he's on trial some years in Greece, along with Sara Martini and 22 other activists and workers after they were part of a search and rescue team on the Greek island of Lesbos in 2018. We also have with us Patricia Heidegger, who is an eco-feminist, um, who is also Deputy Secretary General of the um, European Environmental Bureau, which is the largest network of environmental citizens organizations in Europe. Incidentally, also she was together with me part of the plenary sessions of the Conference on the Future of Europe. So we rocked uh, Strasbourg in the Conference on the Future of Europe for a few months to bring the voice of civil society. Uh, we also have remotely uh, with us David Rotigno, who is advocacy manager in Le Mouvement Associatif, which is the largest um, uh, French federation of NGOs uniting together more than 700,000 associations in France. Um, I'm saying and I'm insisting on the figure because often we've been asking the question who you are and who do you represent. So sometimes it's important for us to also have figures be behind uh, the names of our member organizations and constituencies. Uh, and Valentina um, Brinis, who is advocacy officer at Open Arms uh, in Italy, which was formed in 2015 in response to the migrant humanitarian crisis in recent years. So let's start with Justina. Uh, please tell us a little bit about your story and mainly what are your hopes and expectations from the EU, what the EU can do to make your life easier on the ground and not only yours, but all the movements that are defending women's rights, but then ultimately I think it's more than a women's rights fight, it's a fight for democracy. 
Thank you for the sweet introduction. <laughs> uh, I've been helping with abortion for 16 years. Uh, and uh, as you said, one week ago, I, uh, I, I have heard the verdict uh, when the Polish court uh, said that I am guilty of helping. Uh, the sentence was the limitation of my freedom in form of controlled community service. Uh, I need to, to do 30 hours um, per month uh, for eight months, 10 months, sorry. <laughs> um, 24 hours later, um, I received the sentence. The judge from my trial uh, got a huge promotion to the Appalachian Court. Uh, I was sentenced because I just sent this kind of pills. This is Mifepristone and Misoprostol. The abortion pills to a woman who desperately asked them uh, to send. I had to spill for my own use, uh, and those pills are the safest abortion methods uh, in, uh, I think we can, we can say it right now in the whole world. During my uh, last hearing, I made a final speech. I ended up, I ended it with the, those words. I am innocent. The guilt lies with the country, Poland, that betrayed me, betrayed the person who I, I was trying to help, betrayed Miss Isabella, who died uh, in the Polish hospital because she was not given a life-saving abortion, and countries uh, to betray millions of women in Poland, uh, in, and continues to betray millions uh, woman in Poland. Helping in abortion is necessary, especially when you live in a country like, uh, like Poland, uh, where all access to abortion is provided by informal groups and non-governmental organizations. It's us, the activists, who repair the damage of uh, the Polish uh, anti-abortion act causes every day. I know uh, that I would do it again. Uh, I not feel guilty. Uh, it's never a crime to support another woman uh, in, uh, when she's in need. It's not something any of us should be ashamed of. I am the one of the people who answered the uh, Abortion Without Borders helpline, which has been operating since de December 2019. Every day from 8 to 8, uh, you and every other person who is living in Poland can call to number 2229 22597 uh, and receive abortion care. We are not theoreticians. We just give a practical information how to terminate a pregnancy. It means that we advise how to order safe pills, how to prepare to abortion, uh, what will happen during the procedure. We guide people through the entire process. Uh, Poland, second to Malta, has one of the strictest abortion uh, regulation in Europe. Two years ago, the Constitutional Court uh, banned abortion and in case of the fetal defects. As abortion without borders in the last uh, two years alone, we had over 100,000 people from Poland to access uh, to safe abortion. Uh, the, this is average about one, uh, 107 abortion every day. We also help organize abortion in the foreign clinics. We pay to uh, procedure, pay for the travel, pay, pay for the hotels. Uh, since the verdict the Constitutional Tribunal did in 2020, over 2,000 people have used our support uh, to get a surgical abortion in the foreign countries. Uh, however, abortion uh, um, in the foreign clinics is only 1% uh, of all abortions we, uh, we had to arrange only 1% because we, th there is a better method, this method, the pills. Uh, the method which is recommended by WHO, which is non-invasive, safe, uh, safer than pregnancy, safer than tooth extraction, and even safer than uh, using a Viagra pill. Uh, this method doesn't require the anesthesia, the method uh, which is, uh, according to WHO, doesn't even require the doctor assistance and can be done at home completely by ourselves. Uh, this method, uh, most women and uh, also around the, uh, in Poland and also in, uh, around the whole world use this, uh, and uh, they can be ordered and uh, safely uh, delivered by Inst International Foundation Women Help Women. 
Uh, so uh, when we talk about the needs we have, we call it this uh, 3D. Uh, Kinga and Natalia, my colleagues from Abortion Dream Team, they, uh, they uh, name it. This is the demedicalization, decriminalization, and destigmatization. And uh, to be honest, for sending these pills, I could be, I could go to prison not only in Poland. Uh, to be honest, I ever, in, I even if I send it in here in Belgium, I could go to jail. Uh, in countries who support financially us, uh, those uh, those laws you they are uh, could uh, uh, could put me in, into jail. So. European legislation is not uh, not only the Polish one, it's massively behind the scientific knowledge and uh, recommendation of WHO. Almost every country has its own arbitrary conditions that hinder access to abortion. Absurd conditions, incompatible with the state of scientific knowledge, but above all, incompatible with the needs of a woman. So medicalization, it means that it's safe and it can be done at home without a doctor. It's not a dangerous thing. The myth that the safe abortion equal a legal one and performed only by in the hospital is just a myth. The WHO guidelines uh, are clear. Abortion with pills doesn't require a doctor. It requires a safe, a peaceful home. It requires no social stigma. A doctor is only needed in the ter late term abortion and serious complications. Uh, situation in Poland is a proof that it's, that it's uh, enough to question one the, of, of the exceptions of, to abortion law to cause an effect that doctors feel, uh, feel the chilling effect and stop performing abortions. The doctors would sooner risk the, the lives of their patients rather than uh, lose their jobs. Abortion cannot be a part of the political games. Abortion law cannot be created by the trades of, uh, of our rights and choosing some specific parameters that are not allowed the, to own our bodies. We lose in such uh, trade-offs. Uh, we, we, the women, we are the, lose, uh, we are the people who lose. And uh, presently in Poland, access to abortion is the subject of uh, ideological campaign and human rights defender as being forced to, uh, by a prosecutor office, helping women requires a uh, huge human and financial, financial resources. As abortion law worries, we spent 2 million um, Polish zloty to help abortion, uh, to help other women. So uh, if there will be any chance that the European Union can help abortion, uh, can support uh, abortion out borders with some money, uh, we would be able to pay for, the, for those procedures, especially uh, we, we are very close to the financial crisis in Poland. Thank you. Thank you, Justina. Um, yes, I don't know if the EU will be able to help uh, financially, but in any case, uh, I think it's clear for everybody that uh, abortion rights and women's rights in general are democratic rights. And I think that there's a lot that, that we can do together to defend democracy and to defend the activists that are in the front line to defend their rights and democracy. Um, we go next to Sean Binder, if she, he is online with us. Sean, are you back and ready to connect? Yes, thank you so much. And I would just uh, ask you to be brief, if possible, because we are uh, very much behind schedule. I know it's not fair, uh, so I really apologize for everybody, but from now on, I will try to remind you to be as brief as possible, but still uh, be able to post messages, please. Of course, and, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll be as brief as I, I can. I'll give you a broad overview of, of my experience and then outline some broad ideas that I think uh, are part of that remedy. So I um, was doing search and rescue. I coordinated search and rescue, primarily helping folks who are coming across the European external border to seek asylum on the island of Lesbos. 
Uh, I did this for nearing a year and always in conjunction or in cooperation with the authorities. And yet I was arrested in 2018 and spent three and a half months in pre-trial prison until eventually being released on bail where I remain. I am waiting for a trial for a number of charges. The felonies include being part of a criminal organization, money laundering, and of course, facilitating illegal entry. And if we are to be found guilty, we will receive a sentence that exceeds a thousand years. The misdemeanors for which we've had a stop and start uh, trial process that has not yet concluded includes forgery, the illegal use of radio frequencies, and my childhood dream come true, uh, spying. It is worth noting, of course, that we have given our case file to any organization willing to, to look at it. And unanimously, they have said these are baseless, farcical charges. The EU and the UN have, have named this at various times the largest case of criminalization of solidarity. However, we are very much not alone. This is happening across the European Union. There are at least 180 odd people who have been subject to this kind of process in at least 14 EU member states since the beginning of the so-called migration crisis relating only to one very specific EU directive, the facilitation directive of 2002. And so if there is no evidence of any wrongdoing, then why do we not have a trial? Why? have we not resolved this issue? And I believe it is because the prosecution is engaged in a delay tactic. It is quite clear that we've done nothing wrong and yet the best outcome therefore is to have us in limbo, to hang the sort of Damocles over our heads because of course, with the uncertainty of whether or not this work is legal, other organizations have ceased doing search and rescue. On the island of Lesbos today, there's no more formal search and rescue organization operation, despite it still being a deadly journey. And so with this broad outline of what has happened to me and what is happening at the EU level on a, on a systematic and structured basis, what can be done about it? Well, I don't have any radical requests. Ironically, uh, me being a supposed criminal, I'm here pining for the rule of law. I believe that we have all of the legal requirements in place to ensure this shouldn't happen. The facilitation directive itself uh, outlines uh, an exemption clause for search and rescuers. We have a requirement for legal certainty that is not being observed in our trial. We have a right to a fair trial that isn't being observed because the judges and even the prosecution in the most previous trial agreed that we are deserving of procedural for example, having our, our translations issued to us, indictments sent to us in good time, having certainty around what exactly the, the law, what we're being charged with, none of these things were observed. And far more importantly, of course, there is a right to seek asylum. There is a, a duty imposed on maritime actors to provide search and rescue. And so my, what I believe is important is that we simply insist on rule of law principles that are well established on democratic principles that are well established and on national laws that should simply be upheld. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. We move on now to Patricia Heidegger from the European Environment Review. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm here on behalf of a, a big network of environmental organizations. I myself work at environmental policy in Brussels, um, but we work with a lot of people um, working um, at the front lines of our environmental struggles. And I just wanted to share a few examples of what we are seeing um, in the last uh, years. A red thread that we see throughout um, kind of any obstacles created for environmental and climate organizations is that it comes uh, difficult every time our activism challenges um, powerful corporate interests, not the secret, um, but it's definitely a red thread um, that we that we see. Um, uh, yeah, as I've said, I mean, I have the privilege to be working in a relatively safe space. We got our own little taste of um, what can happen a few years ago when together with some other um, fellow campaigners, um, we were um, 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 uh, opposed with a, a strategic lawsuit against public um, participation 
in a non-EU country um, where we're being sued for defamation and kind of hindering of uh, economic activities um, over several million euro, euro um, several uh, million um, US dollars. Um, for us sitting here, this is kind of something we can kind of look at with a little smile. But of course, for our colleagues um, having to live and work in a country with um, for corrupt judiciary, there's very little we can do for them. And um, this lawsuit is also still pending after eight years. So there's the same kind of, you know, um, tactics to kind of um, uh, keep our colleagues in limbo basically forever, um, even though our lawyers say that um, they might not succeed with this uh, um, case. However, um, for, the, for the colleagues on the ground, obviously, um, uh, yeah, they have to live in this limbo situation maybe for the next, for the next decade. Um, so just uh, two um, things I wanted to uh, mention. One um, is linked to the, the, the issue of strategic lawsuits against public participation. So abusive lawsuits um, that target watchdogs, environmental human rights defenders and civil society organizations. Um, as you probably all know, at the moment, um, the EU at the European level, we are discussing a, a directive um, against SLEPs um, together with many other environmental groups and, and probably many of you here. We're also part of the, the case coalition, which has been pushing for that directive. Um, and we're not um, pleased to see um, uh, where things are at the moment with a compromise text that has been offered by the Swedish presidency, which we believe um, is um, detrimental to the objective that we wanted to achieve with this directive. Um, yes, um, so um, we believe that we need more um, kind of effective early dismissal of such abusive lawsuits. We need a compensation um, of damage for those people who have been, um, um, you know, harassed with slaps, and we need clear uh, um, measures to deter slaps. Um, and so this is not necessarily yet guaranteed. And the second point, and I'll keep it super short, um, is um, the criminalization of climate activists that we've been seeing, especially in the last year. Um, most uh, prominently those um, within the, the last generation movement, we may like or dislike. There, um, there are types of activities that forms of protest, but as long as people protest um, in, in a peaceful way, um, in, in, as long as they uh, practice civil disobedience, which is peaceful, um, we cannot allow for, for that criminalization. Um, in Germany, which is one of the countries that uh, Civicus showed as uh, the dark green country, so with a kind of uh, open um, civic space, we have seen um, many uh, climate activists being put in um, preventive detention, um, which in some of the German states is a possible, I and mean, which, was, which was kind of made easier for the police without the involvement of courts to uh, prevent terrorist acts. So this terrorist legislation um, laws are used to um, put um, climate activists in preventive detention. And I see that other countries, for instance, Austria are now already discussing um, the same tactics. Um, so also here, there's a call to, um, well, both European institutions um, to closely monitor the situation, um, but also to member states uh, to not use, um, for instance, uh, laws that were put in place to prevent terrorist acts to use against uh, climate activists. Thank you, Patricia. We move on now to uh, David Ratino from Le Mouvement Associatif. Is David online connected with us? Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, please. You have two minutes, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want first to, to thank you for inviting us to, to, to this event and to, to uh, thanks the European Seek Forum. Um, the main goal of my presentation is to inform you what's happening in France with the contract of uh, commitments to Republican principles, or as we call it in French, le contrat d'engagement républicain. Just for giving to you a few elements uh, of context, in France, we have uh, uh, the law of 1901 provides a, a highly liberal frame for enabling uh, freedom of association. Uh, in particular, no authorization has to be given for citizens to come together and create an association. So no, con no condition of citizenship is uh, required. And uh, the legal framework of civil liberties changed after terrorist attacks in, two, in uh, 2015 and uh, in 2021, after the killing of a French professor, uh, Samuel Paty, the government decided to adopt uh, the separatism law 
which became the law on the respect of the Republican principles. So it claims reinforcing the neutrality and secularism of public services and uh, associations. So it's also among the region governing to dis the, the, the dissolution of association. And since um, 2022, the, the association will reclaim uh, public services like a grant or any service uh, to uh, administrative authorities from any state institution has to sign this contract to claim they uh, agree with the, with the Republican principles. So the contract specifies uh, the commitments in seven different plans for respect to the symbols uh, and principles of the Republic and secular character. And um, it refrained from any action that undermines public order. This law changed um, the relationship by asking to association to claim first their attachment to, to the Republic before asking uh, any services, which is uh, totally different than the, the law for association from 1901. Um, the, the, the last year, we have few cases, and the most uh, important of these cases about application of this contract is Altern Atibaric represents the most, uh, most of the problem we, we have with, uh, with this contract. So Altern Atibai is a, a non parliament association in France who ask uh, for a grant, uh, they ask uh, for a grant uh, to the city of Poitiers uh, in the south of France to organize an event about ecology. And uh, the municipal council decide to vote to vote uh, the a grant to the association for this event. And during this event, Alternativa proposed a workshop to sensibilize about uh, civil disobedience. And a uh, few days before the event uh, of uh, of Alternativa, the prefect, so the, the state of of, uh, of France, asked to the mayor of Poitiers, Leonard Montconduy, to to take back the grant to Alternativa because of this workshop. We were talking about uh, civil disobedience. The, the, the prefect considered that civil disobedience is contrary to, to the contract and to Republican principles. So the mayor of Poitiers decided to not to, the mayor of Poitiers decided not to listen to the prefect and to maintain the grant to Alternativa since the prefect and uh, the city uh, are in justice to know uh, who is right. The association decided to support the mayor for defending Alternativa. And for us, it's a very important case because a lot of climate actions defended uh, by environments and uh, other associations use the civic disobedience today. So if the justice considers that civic disobedience call into question the Republican principles, a uh, lot of organizations could be could be in danger in the in the future. So we are clearly concerned about this case because it's used for pedagogic documents. Uh, this case is used in pedagogic documents by the state for uh, explain uh, how the, this contract can be used uh, to uh, retire a grant to uh, to an organization. So. Thank so you, David. It, I'm afraid yes. you will you will need to conclude. I'm sorry for that. Yes, so, so thank you. Just, uh, just we we continue to to claim the abrogation about this contract, but we need uh, more more um, more uh, more help from, from the government, and they don't really listen to us. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, we go to Valentina Brinis from Open Arms. Thank you, good morning. I'm Valentina Brini from Open Arms. It is a Spanish NGO that provides assistance. Can you hear me? Well, okay. That provides assistance to the people in need in the Central Mediterranean Sea. Yes. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. It is important for us to share uh, with you our job condition and our position. Uh, I immediately go to the main issues. Uh, we operate in the Central Mediterranean Sea since the 2015, before we were in, uh, in Greece, in the GMC. Uh, here in the Central Med, we rescued uh, 65,000 people in seven years. 
and we did together with other NGOs and together with them we rescued at the same time in the same seven years more than 250,000 people. Uh, since uh, 2017, we are considered, especially in uh, in Italy and especially by the Italian newspaper and institution, we are considered as uh, criminals, trafficants, uh, uh, and trafficants, especially of human beings from the North African countries. And for this reason, for this reason, in uh, the last uh, five years, uh, we faced with 20 administrative and uh, juridical trials. OpenAnt is going through uh, one of these, that is very important trial in front of the Palermo court against the uh, previous Minister of Interior, Mr. Uh, Matteo Salvini. With the new government, uh, the, the government that is currently in charge, the situation totally collapsed, and every day uh, in all the newspaper, our job is under attack. The first law of this the new, uh, gov uh, the, the new government has been the regulation of our job, our, I mean, NGO, not just the job of open arms, of our job, even though we have demonstrated during these 20 trials that we operate uh, under the main maritime law. Uh, and this is happening while uh, the people are dying, as the uh, recent shipwreck in Crotone, Crotone is a city in the south of Italy, has demonstrated. Uh, I, I just want to add that every day in Italy we are uh, we are finding uh, a new dead body in the same coast. So it is very terrible situation. But the priority for our government is to punish our job. Okay, uh, I go to conclude my very short speech. Uh, how to solve this situation? Um, we have always to to remember that we we as NGO we are working to rescue people in the central med. And this is a job that could be done by the uh, European member states uh, with a specific uh, migration strategy. Um, related to our job, the Italian government is the main institution that uh, we face with. So we believe that the uh, EU, EU entities could promote the Italian National Human Rights Authority that could be able to monitoring and respect the support of human rights defenders. The authority could prepare and coordinate a national program for the protection of human rights defenders that operates with the active participation of civil society and defenders and ensure interinstitutional coordination and capacity for the investigation and follow up of possible violation of human rights defenders' rights. This is just uh, two very quick uh, but not uh, uh, less important proposal and uh, we need to share with you, but in general, a more constant relationship with the EU institution would be a right way to support our job in terms of uh, human rights. Thank you so much and I really apologize for the short um, time available to speak because uh, I think these kind of experience really deserve uh, much more. They are actually documented by civil society, by the uh, fundamental rights agency, the European Commission knows and integrates uh, slowly in the annual rule of law report. Um, I think they illustrate these examples, but there are so many more uh, across Europe. I, I think they illustrate how much activists that are in the front line, how much they are criminalized, stigmatized, stigmatized attacked. Uh, sometimes we are talking also about physical attacks and violence and police violence, but also they illustrate how organized traditional civil society is in danger because through the French case and to a certain extent also experiences coming from the environmental sector show that uh, more and more states are shifting, as Chada said in the beginning, from their duty to protect civil society, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, to casting through legislation or law enforcement uh, a general suspicion on civil society sector as a whole, uh, suspicion on uh, being uh, vulnerable or vectors for terrorism, money laundering, um, smuggling uh, and many, many more. So uh, I really think that in a context when we as civil society, we are so happy to see, uh, thanks to the Swedish presidency, that the council for the first time ever 
has not only a word in its conclusion mentioning civil society, but really one page uh, dedicating to the protection of civil society space and to recognizing the important role of civil society. I think this is a very powerful engine that if we don't use it right now in all our uh, contexts, EU institutions, national member states that can champion it and us civil society, we risk very high having uh, in mind the perspective of next European elections and what it can bring, not only in terms of re electoral results for the composition of the parliament, but in terms of very um, toxic national debates that can, can happen in that context. So we really urge European institutions to take these testimonies very seriously. And I'm sure that we will have the opportunity with the upcoming panels uh, to go into more depths and to hear uh, what we can hope, what we have on the table currently in the pipeline and what can be done in the future also. So the next panel uh, will be moderated by Vera Mora, who is um, an outstanding activist. She's coming from Hungary and she is director of Okotas Foundation, which unfortunately is also very famous, not only in Hungary, but also in Europe. So please finish the floor and uh, I'm from the European Network of National Human Rights Institution. Ah, very good. Yeah. So we do that. I believe uh, we have all speakers for this panel in the panel. Uh, first of all, thank you for the introduction, and we have the distinguished contributor to this panel. Uh, let me welcome Joachim Hermann, a uh, member of uh, Commissioner Reinhardt's uh, cabinet. Uh, Henry Nichols, head of policy analysis and stakeholder cooperation sector uh, in the fundamental rights agency, and Katrin Mervisen from the European Network of National Human Rights Education. And the subject of this panel is, as Sasha mentioned, the rule of law report uh, and its impact uh, on and used by civil society uh, across Europe. This is a few years old uh, instrument uh, and we are very happy to see how it is being extended and improved uh, to consider the matter of civil space and civil society more and more compared to the initial um, versions. Now, as I've mentioned, I'm coming from Hungary, and together with other Hungarian human rights organizations, every year we contribute uh, to the writing of the report detailing the situation in, in our country, not because we, ho we hope that it will have a big impact on our beloved government or achieve change overnight in the state of rule of law in Hungary, but rather we think it is essential to highlight the trends and the developments and the call for European action uh, on rule of law and democratic backsliding in the member states. Um, but first, um, we heard uh, these very concerning testimonies uh, in the previous section. And let me first uh, turn to Joachim Hermann uh, and ask you, what are your initial thoughts, initial um, reactions uh, to these testimonies, uh, if you could shortly introduce them as a first speaker in the panel. I think this is the right mic. Thank you very much, Vera. Um, yes, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to to be with you here this 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 morning. And um, West, first of all, thank you for the possibility to exchange with you here today. It's very important. Uh, it's maybe the first thing to 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 listen to you, to discuss with you. And, and notably, um, I would like to, to thank uh, Justina, Sean, uh, Patricia, David, and Valentina for their for their moving testimonies. Um, um, so I'm sure, yeah, we can we can go into that. Um, um, you mentioned the rule of law report. Several of you did. Um, I'm I'm happy that it was mentioned in a, I would say, cautiously 
positive positive way yeah maybe just to just to 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 remind where we where we come from so uh, july last year the commission published the third edition of the of the rule of law report um um and um as you have already hinted at there there are there's a bit of a deepening yeah from edition to edition um there's a deepening but there's also um that you can put these reports next to each other yeah and you can then see the trends in certain countries we have you know the, the chapeau with the general tendencies and then for every member state a country chapter um there are four pillars the fourth pillar is is, is dedicated to checks and balances where ngos play a prominent role we use uh, the rating of, of civicus it was very interesting uh, to listen uh, to the presentation you have given and it's, it's also very interesting to see the scores that that were maybe not available be, beforehand so that would certainly be um, in, in inspiring um, and so you can see over time it's also a picture every year so it's becoming a film over over time um, um, how can the rule of law report support uh, your work um, First of all, to recall that for to prepare this uh, report, uh, the, the 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 colleagues uh, from the Commission um, they are meeting very intensively, not only um, with the institutional representatives of the member states, but very much so also also with civil society. Um, and uh, we see the contrast between the different statements, and it gives the Commission a basis also. And I think this is it's essential to to make up its own evaluation because after all, the novelty is. That this report is a report from from the European Commission, and so your participation in this is is really important. And you know, for instance, uh, last year we had 500 meetings with 650 authorities and stakeholders in all 27 member states. And of course, we don't only meet uh, 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 civil society that is characteristic for the landscape, but also the European umbrella associations. So the idea is really to get a holistic view uh, of the situation. Um, and then the report does two things. Uh, first of all, it, it records yeah, what is happening. I think it's, it's very important. The commission is putting on paper certain things. I've listened to your testimonies and I think some of, as, some, some of these aspects there are indeed mentioned in the report in different country chapters, if, if, you, if you look them up. And secondly, the report call, recalls that there are standards. Yeah, there you, we have European standards and they are setting a, setting a frame that needs to be needs to be respected. So um, this is an objective assessment. We do it uh, on an equal footing for all 27 member states. And it's there for, for everyone uh, to discuss. And, and we have deepened this also last year with the novelty of, uh, of country specific recommendations. If you look at the country chapters on the second page, you have uh, recommendations across the four pillars of the rule of law report, of course, on the most important topics. And there is a number of recommendations that concerns civic space or, or civil society. Um, so last year, I think we had this for, for seven member states, Germany, Ireland, Greece, Latvia, Hungary, Poland, and Sweden. So you also really see it's, it's across the board. We're also looking at, at being consistent here, of course. Um, and, um, and so these recommendations, they are, they are there. And um, um, they are there also to, to be discussed, but before I go into that, um, I would like to add that, of course, this year is the first year when we look at how have the Commission recommendations been followed up, yeah, so that is, of course, something that you should also pay attention to, this will be the focus of the report that will be upcoming in, in July, in July this year. Um, so, sorry, am I talking too long? Okay, but it just, I can just say very briefly what is really key for us and then Henry can, I would like to thank him also for this is the follow up on the report yeah that um, that this is being discussed not only it's discussed with the, uh, the ministers the Swedish presidency yesterday, we had a discussion of, of five member states and this regular discussion, I will, will complete the first circle of the 27 member states, but we also want to go into the depth so not only are the commissioners in charge traveling to the member states discussing meeting every time civil society but we are also looking to to have a discussion on the report in the member states and their pra together with the member states they're organized uh, with the uh, with the commission uh, we are organizing uh, meetings the platform for civil society to to discuss based on the rule of law report and notably the chapter uh, for civil society okay i will, I will stop here maybe we can um, even this later thank you
Yes, thank you very much. Um, And as the promise mentioned, let's uh, move on to Henry Cohn's. Uh, the Crown has been monitoring the state of civil uh, space in Europe for quite a number of years now. And how has the agency been involved in the rule of law mechanism? And how do you think it could be further improved uh, in the future? Uh, thank you, Derek. First of all, um, hi, everybody. I'm the emergency wheel. All my colleagues who work on the issue could not be here today, but I'm here today. So, uh, if I can't answer all your questions, I will show you part of the money. Having said this, yes, indeed, the agency has been working on civic space since 2016. We have uh, since 2018 a report on civic space, and for that report, we do a consultation with civil society organizations about the whole number of them took part this year. And uh, we also, uh, in this report, we use it not only to uh, monitor when when I'm learning about it, but to provide information that other people use to help them when they are in civil space. And the information that we collect for this um, report will be provided to the European Commission or the European uh, Commission on the topic of the global report. And uh, there we are maybe in the area that we can highlight in terms of the global data to see the mission. Where is this information is coming from? So there is the European and the Asian Rights Information System, which is looking at what is happening on the international level in terms of that. So information we extract from there from each and every member states. Uh, we extract evidence from this annual consultation we have in civil space. And uh, this year, as I mentioned, and we heard about it already, uh, uh, this is for the people online. I hope that there is. Uh, there is a uh, adding also information pertaining to the situation of the external borders we were talking about before in this morning. Um, but beyond, so like the agency is actually contributing to this uh, rule of law in two ways. The first way is the annual submission. The second way is uh, we are in constant dialogue with our counterparts in front of the European Commission. It's not like what well, is this consultation. Who would who would be the real? Now we provide also. Uh, deeper evidence, which is also useful. Our, our own reports, we have a, not, uh, a network of multidisciplinary researchers in the member states, in each of the member states, to collect and gather evidence and developments related to this state in the member states. We produce a lot of reports, but we also provide that to the information which then is also to prepare its fact finding mission in the member states. And as we mentioned now, there is essentially more and more information on the space in that report, and that's a good thing to me. If no one needs our efforts, it's also all the last year or so, so it's such organizations. So it's very important to contribute to the consultation. Um, and the third, you know, we mentioned the national group, national dialogue, so I want to mention more about it. But another aspect is like what could be improved. Uh, you asked so, uh, maybe uh, some three points. One on the uh, on the consultation on the rule of law, I mean, we hear from civil society organizations that they would have there for consultation, but we there for a longer time because it's over Christmas, there might not be enough out there. We hear that, but maybe simply if the questions are rather predictable, it can still be possible to get there beforehand. And we don't always have to wait for the deadline, folks are working on the first place. This is something that we can as regards the rule of law report itself, from the perspective of the agency, it's, it's good and it's fine, it works well. It was a major step forward uh, to make such a report and to have it uh, set up the mechanism in the first place. But it's important maybe to think about the purpose of that report. Uh, what is the purpose? Uh, and also, about it. So if it's to raise awareness of the rule of law, warn the stakeholders that civil society organizations to this issue, make them engage more with the, the rule of law report, and then generate a serious debate at national levels. Then the report, it could be said, is, or, is already a human thing that is trying to make that purpose to be. But on civic space, what maybe could be improved in the report is to have a more consistent list of key issues that could be developed that is probably equally across the different reports because they seem to be, they, they have very criticism about the report on civic space or even complaint comparing it to the countries, maybe something like that. And then finally, at the cross of the international dialogues, we have mentioned that, but I mean, it's, it's important to express that these are should be multi-stakeholder conversations on the rule of law, meaning only the actors that are 
from this company you take it. Um, and uh, you do those dialogues, you know, organized one in Croatia recently in the, the China Hong Kong space, so it's very super kind of exchange. And you show them what it's saying to, to, uh, to confront the business environment. And the last thing for me from now is that, of course, change will not come from a model of dialogue. Uh, and notwithstanding the principle of equal treatment, it might be more desirable at these initial stages to go to some countries and do that in a very sustainable way rather than trying to cover all the places one after the other and all the other ones like work on the business. Thank you. If you have questions, I'll answer what I can. If I come, I'll bring them up to everybody. Thank you very much, and thank you for this very concrete suggestion. And uh, let me go back to your house again. Um, uh, one of the um, issues uh, that we're speaking over and over now is the recommendations and the rather new element uh, in, the, in the report, which is very much welcome. But uh, as regards, for example, civil society, in the case of the hunter report, uh, the only recommendation regarding civil society was, and I quote, remove obstacles affecting civil society organization. And to be actually honest, it wasn't too much to do all for us and civil society because it's not too complete. So, how do you think um, the report could be further strengthened in terms of the recommendations and also in terms of what? Uh, uh, can you just tell us about uh, the unevenness of how the report is the different countries of our civil society? So, considering maybe some sort of chapter in civil society, further refining the recommendations or any other suggestion for the future. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, So, first of all, um, indeed, uh, it's good to be uh, uh, concrete on the deliverables. Um, before I go directly to your question, just to mention that um, that this year we have also prolonged the consultation period uh, uh, for civil society. So this was a request that came from you, and I hope that uh, that now there's there's more time available for you to give the input. And if you look at the commission's website, you will also see that that we are um, we've increased the transparency of the whole process. Yeah. So for instance, if you want to know when is a country visit upcoming in in my member state, this is now very clearly uh, shown on the on the commission's website so now when we come to the recommendations of course i mean uh, we need to have we, we have a certain width of of recommendations for each member state and again i mean these recommendations do not give the complete picture yeah i mean for some member states we could have maybe more uh, recommendations but it's not always possible to be to, to be so broad we need, to, we need certain focus um and um um, so that to be taken into account that we need to look at the overall picture in a member state and then look across the four pillars, what, what are the most important recommendations. There's already a number of recommendations on civil society. We will see uh, when we now see what has been fulfilled. There may be new recommendations coming in. They may again include civil society. Um, and you mentioned uh, now, of course, there can be recommendations that are quite broad. We will assess the follow-up. And I think that's very important to engage uh, with the commission that you discuss with us, yeah, what has been followed up? Has it been fully followed up? Uh, no, if not, uh, how can this be refined? Yeah, this is a debate we will certainly have within the commission, but that we also want to have with you, yeah? Uh, so um, um, that's good Good to to hear your, your, your views. And I think I would also like to mention at, at this stage here, the uh, national human rights institutions, which are equally covered by this report in which, uh, have, which are a key element of the, of the civic space. Uh, which we support and which we also cover, um, including, of course, with the recommendation. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, we move on to consumerism. Uh, so, how has uh, the national human rights institution been involved in the process? And uh, how can civil society better cooperate uh, with the institutions to contribute to the rule of law rule of law report and to use the rule of law report? Thank you, Vera. Um, I think your question already points to one of the most important messages I want to bring here um, to all of us, actually. We need to get stronger together. 
we heard the reference to the rule of law report as a movie. Year by year, we see a certain story and how it is changing. Well, sadly, so far, this is a typical European movie with a sad ending. We should get to a more happy uh, movie. And for that, we really need to keep on working together. And here, I also want to really commend the organizers of this event. It's so important that activists, civil society organizations, national human rights institutions, EU institutions, the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, I see the presidency of the, uh, the current presidency of the council also uh, represent. It's so important that we um, discuss openly together on how we can get stronger together. So NHRIs are allies of civil society. Um, how do and I mean, NHRIs are pluralistic bodies, so while, while they are independent state institutions, their composition of the decision-making body typically will include different strands of civil society. Also in their daily work, NHRIs need to cooperate with civil society. So often NHRIs are referred to as bridge builders between government uh, authorities and uh, civil society and human rights defenders. NHRIs have been engaging quite a lot um, on rule of law and also on the uh, initiatives of the commission, which we believe are really uh, important to address the challenges. So every year through ENRI, we develop a reporting uh, template, which will take into account the commission's approach to the rule of law reporting, but we also go a step beyond. NHRIs each year indicate to our network what they believe are the most important aspects to focus on within the rule of law reporting. And this has entailed that this year, for example, NHRIs across Europe in their rule of law reporting are focusing on civic space, are focusing on the impacts of artificial intelligence on the rule of law, and are also focusing on assessing the implementation of regional court judgments. Um, the reporting of NHRIs to the rule of law also shows the intrinsic intertwinement of human rights, democracy, and rule of law. And in that sense, we also think it's important that the Commission also um, conceives uh, its actions on the rule of law in that sense, uh, not to work in silos, but to interconnect the different uh, pillars and the different EU fundamental values. NHRIs report on the landscape of rule of law, but they also report each year to the Commission on what they are doing to address the challenges they identified. And often NHRIs will, in those efforts, also work with civil society organizations. We agree that the inclusion by the Commission of uh, the recommendations in the reporting, it's a positive step for NHRIs as well, it's a very interesting uh, aspect because NHRIs do at national level annual reporting and they provide recommendations to which they present to parliament and which they then follow up. So it means that NHRIs can also use now the commission's recommendations to feed into their own domestic action. And thereby we foresee that there will be a virtuous cycle so that NHRIs feed into the recommendations of the Commission, and then they bring these recommendations of the Commission back home. And each year again, we will also report on the extent to which uh, state authorities are following up the recommendations or not. We do agree also with the uh, remark that has been made that the recommendations could be more uh, specific and actionable. Um, so, of course, we can also and we will also provide uh, some uh, input uh, in that respect. Um, the rule of law reporting serves both um, to build a culture of rights, but also to make sure that the most serious challenges are addressed through enforcement. And so while we really think the roundtable initiatives are very useful, 
We think uh, it is also important that the Commission would support the integration of the rule of law reporting into more formal processes at national level. So actually using the checks and balances in place at national level to promote follow up to the rule of law reporting, for example, by ensuring parliamentary debates and by ensuring that civil society actors and NHRIs are included in those debates. Uh, at the same, in the same sense, we think that at the EU level, the rule of law dialogues could and should include independent actors such as NHRIs and civil society organizations. This is actually already done uh, at the UN in the context of the Universal Periodic Review. Then I'm just going to say a few words on enforcement. Um, we think that it would be good if when the Commission identifies that some issues are structural issues, they require structural responses. One good practice example is the initiative of the EU SLAP directive. We heard also that the directive itself can be improved, but at least it's, a, it's an example of a structural re response with structural challenge. We heard this morning quite some testimonies about another structural challenge, the criminalization of solidarity, the criminalization of uh, HRDs. So this also requires more structural responses. Strategic litigation should be supported at domestic level. The current SURF calls are a good step again to support civil society organizations to engage in strategic litigation at national level, but we need more. And one of the things we need more, and we will discuss this also later today, is the setup of an EU protection mechanism in support of rights defenders, civil society organizations. Um, we have done an initial mapping at ENRI of the protection mechanisms that are existing, and it's quite blatant that protection mechanisms exist mostly for defenders outside of the European Union, while within the European Union, it's much more difficult for defenders to be defended. So this is really a gap that should also be uh, bridged and addressed. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are pressed for time, but I think mentioning the rule of law dialogue uh, was one uh, important element. But now, um, related to that, we will take some reaction from the participants from the civil society point of view. So, what are the experiences uh, in the rule of law report and mechanism? How could be more useful at the national level? And I think we have, hopefully, we have with us online on the Kuchin stuff from OFO, the Polish Network of Civil Society Organizations. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, great. Great, thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you very much for inviting us. As said, I represent the Polish Federation of Non Governmental Organizations. We are a federation at national level. And when it comes to representation, we uh, in an, our member organization associate um, around 1 million people. Uh, uh, our experiences, maybe a general comment about the rule of law as such, we definitely find it a helpful or helpful as a monitoring and advocacy tool. We agree that it improves transparency, amplifies our voices vis-a-vis, -vis, and especially our position vis-a-vis -vis our national government. Uh, and it definitely provides a platform for NGOs to voice their concerns, but we definitely think that on its own, as it stands now, uh, it is not enough and it needs to be included as a broader mechanism. And uh, an interesting thing is that actually what we need is already defined in the political guidelines by the European Commission, which is a document prepared by Ursula von der Leyen to guide her during her time in office. And it defines the condition for improving role of law uh, in the EU as follows. The new way forward brings transparency, allows, allows early detection, and offers targeted, targeted support to resolve any issues at an early stage. Our objective is to find a solution that protects the rule of law with cooperation and mutual support, but without ruling out an effective, proportionate, and dissuasive response uh, as a last resort. And I think we are at the stage where we need that 
precisely that. And I would like to also, from our experiences as uh, national federation, we can say that there is actually a good case in point uh, where such an uh, where such a mechanism already exists, and uh, or an intervention mechanism even we can say, which is this uh, mechanism that uh, we use within the European funds, uh, which uh, which is namely the introduction of the Charter of Fundamental Rights as an enabling condition for making use of uh, the EU cohesion policy funds. Why I mention it? Because this is a concrete tool which every activist, every person, a member of the monitoring committee of EU uh, funds can actually trigger and use. Um, <clears throat> obviously, it depends on the proper functioning of the monitoring uh, committee, committee, but this is actually an example that shows that we can, in fact, imagine and design an effective, proportionate, and dissuasive response. Uh, and making the rule of law or the Charter of Fundamental Rights an integral part of the multi-annual uh, financial framework is a very important practical and useful mechanism. And we could see it, for example, uh, uh, in the case of upending of the so-called uh, LGBTQI free zones. So to sum up, so although the rule of law report, and we find it very helpful in terms of advocacy work uh, in, in our uh, network, uh, we can surely say that on its own, as it stands now, it's not strong enough. Uh, and what is more, we need a mechanism which could be used at COG, as it said, at an early stage, uh, for instance, when serious human rights violations occur. And obviously, a good case in point is the ongoing crisis on the Polish-Belarusian border, where Polish uh, authorities are continuously breaking the law and violating human rights. And such breaches have been actually confirmed by Polish courts, and yet we have no effective pressure mechanism to actually stop it. So I think, uh, you know, Thanks. looking at the way uh, the, uh, the enabling condition as a mechanism work, actually, I think we can figure out or find a way to make the rule of law report part of a broader uh, uh, of a broader mechanism or an intervention tool. I think this is the general uh, remark that I need to make. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another uh, example we found from Croatia, also online, we have Iman Novosa from the Human Rights House, Zagreb. Do we have Iman with us? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Vera, and thank you for uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to to say a few uh, few remarks. Um, indeed, to agree with uh, with Anna, we also um, find the rule of law uh, mechanism an important advocacy um, tool, not only for civil society issues, but also for a variety of other human rights issues that we are working on um, at um, at the national level. And we were very happy to support the the process of of of, of having this mechanism um, alive and participated from the first. Uh, um, uh, from the first version of um, of it. That being said, I think uh, and we believe that um, it um, it it will be it is necessary for uh, civic space to finally uh, get a bigger um, um, uh, standing or more visible standing within the whole um, rule of law um, um, uh, report. Um, it should be uh, much, um, much better that the issues uh, um, regarding civic space should be uh, much better um, elaborated and included in the, in the, in the overall um, report. Um, um, having uh, one to three paragraphs on um, on, on certain issues uh, regarding civic space um, is just not enough and is not um, presenting the variety of, of structural and other issues that civil society is facing uh, here in, uh, in particular um, uh, countries. Um, uh, a way uh, to do that uh, would be actually to uh, um, discuss um, uh, among uh, civil society organizations, but also with the commission, how um, we can um, see commission basically um, 
um, um, raising their capacities to be better at grasping what civil society is facing at the ground. Because I believe at least uh, looking at the creation chapter, um, uh, commission's expertise on the civil society is the weakest um, uh, one uh, compared to expertise in the media sector or, or in the um, or in the judiciary. And that is why um, we don't have issues like financing covered. We don't have issues like public participation, um, dialogue with the authorities and other issues that are important and vital part of the civic um, uh, space. Second point is that um, recommendations on, on, on civic space uh, is uh, something that um, we believe um, should be uh, a, a standing recommendation within the um, uh, rule of law um, recommendations. Um, the, the, the step forward that commission did um, uh, last year uh, was was very was very good with, with all of the weaknesses of, of vague recommendations and, and issues that were mentioned uh, already. Um, we believe that uh, having a recommendation on, on civil uh, on civil society as an it is important tool, especially in countries where civic space is narrowed, as we heard um, uh, before, to open up a dialogue uh, to give uh, NGOs uh, um, uh, a tool to um, to start a dialogue with the national authorities on the on on improving certain um, aspects of, of 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 civic space that are um, uh, problematic. So we would very much support, uh, argue and support of having civic space recommendation uh, for each um, country um, 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 every year. Um, the third point is um, is something that we witnessed from the first uh, um, um, hand uh, this year, the, the importance of it, and that would be having national workshops on, uh, on, on civic space at the national <laughs> level facilitated, <laughs> excuse me, facilitated by the but the European um, uh, Commission earlier this year, uh, we had a similar <laughs> exercise uh, with the Commission on the judiciary. And uh, that was very important because it brought together civil society representatives with uh, uh, with um, uh, uh, key uh, state uh, stakeholders, and uh, we managed to discuss some of the issues that uh, haven't been uh, moved around for um, for years. For years, and that that, that that is an important role that Commission can can play. So uh, having um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, national workshops and dialogues on on the rule of law findings in the area of civic space is something that would be very important. And uh, last but not least something that we mentioned before so many times uh, um, in the beginning, it would be important to change the dates of the publishing of the report and to uh, make it uh, before or after um, a summer so we can indeed utilize the findings for um, giving it prom prominence in the national, national uh, media and in that way uh, to make it more useful in, in advocacy um, uh, sense. Thank oh. you. We'll do that. Oh, and we have a third and last uh, contributor uh, in person, but it is here from Illinois, Europe. I'm speaking of Europe now, uh, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to check out. Yeah. Um, by the commission uh, in, in most countries. 
um, usually only in the work one, which is of course important, but often in the work one, it's like the government isn't willing to cooperate. So for us, it would also be logical to consult elderly guidance and society as much as the government would be willing to listen to recommendations in the future. Um, and then um, we're also finding that uh, notes here. Um, it's really in, in the countries where um, there is difficulty at the government level, what we can say is, and echoing a lot of the uh, things that Katrina said actually, is that um, implementation of the legal framework is really important, um, implementation of judgments is incredibly important, and as the health control just now mentioned, using uh, the kind of strong arm of the EU in the funds and um, monitoring. Um, to, to ensure the respect for EU law and, and compliance with non discrimination. Um, and then I would just want to make a point about um, the European Commission's ability to lead by example. I think that it shouldn't be underestimated uh, the role that they have also, for example, in Poland, where the government does exist to protect LGBTI guy rights. The monitoring committees um, get advice from the European Commission and they take it very seriously. So the Commission has a lot of power there. Um, and we've heard that that uh, LGBTI activists are also part of that the judicial realm and the law. And the Commission drafted is good, but we're seeing that this is really what the family plans and we really need to be uh, worked upon because the EU then comes out with a, a directive that is actually. Better off of being adopted, what, what message is that sending to the member states? And finally, on that note, um, this um, directive that we've been hearing about that the Commission is drafting on what's so called foreign agents. Um, I think we need to be really vigilant about this. Um, you know, we see the Commission can come out with proposals, but it ends up in council and what, what happens? What will happen in council? What do you stand as a moment of setting? Um, we're seeing where elderly directs are under attack, in general, and a variety of sorts of ways are under attack. Governments are looking to adopt not only Russia style foreign agent laws using the US example as a bit with them, like the US. How, how are they going to do that when we have a EU? Will they enable, and I think we have a clear dominance effect, and often those governments are also trying to criminalize their nation. Yeah, we can kind of see mm. that the whole sound of their logical group coming from the commission. Um, but we understand that it's not going to be Russian uh, by the end of May. So, what we would need is that civil society is involved as much as possible in the drafting of this. So that the Commission can create a law that will safeguard democracy. Um, and so that it won't, you know, so you can have a communication where it's showing very clearly this is our style, this is not a Russian style, uh, and this is not an excuse for a government to uh, adopt foreign agent law. Sorry for like the tangent there, but I think it's a really important point. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to give the opportunity for the panelists to react. Uh, I see you are making lots of notes. Uh, we would like to go first. I will keep it brief. Um, just as a few um, things that uh, I would like to add to the um, interventions. So indeed, yes, the, in, the initiation of the enabling conditions is very important, but we should also bear in mind that um, the end of EU funds in itself is not a remedy to the fundamental rights violations. So I believe this would also really be important to address and maybe for the Commission to also think about supporting in case violations are found and EU funds are sought to also address the uh, fundamental rights violations itself at national level. Um, on the recommendation, so yes, actually what I would had, had wanted to, to add also in my uh, intervention before is that we believe it could be really uh, good for the Commission when identifying structural issues to not only adopt country specific recommendations, but also cross regional recommendations when it's clear that there are cross regional 
uh, challenges. Uh, and civic space could be an example. So an, uh, a European Commission recommendation on uh, protecting and supporting civic space. Uh, the same could be valid also for uh, national human rights institutions, uh, because we also see that NHRIs increasingly also in the EU are facing challenges and threats, especially when they do sensitive work in the area of migration and so on. We heard enough about that this morning. Um, then on the, I, I think the last point that was made is actually a very important one. A European Commission, and I think it's a recommendation that is envisaged on uh, foreign agents. It can really play into the cards of the, of the wrong actors. So yes, definition of, of what that would mean and, and a strong contextualization would be super important. And uh, we will also stand ready to feed information into that process and very much agree that civil society would be key to involve in the development of such recommendation thank you yeah thank you very much so so, so to react maybe to the first intervention uh, uh from from the polish colleague just to say yes we have the toolbox yeah and we will look at the differentiated approach um and you have mentioned the horizontal enabling conditions which have actually been applied in the in the polish case and we see also in the example of hungary for instance how different instruments are being used. I will not. I cannot go into detail. I would like to, but there's no time. Uh, then, um, from the Croatian colleague, I agree, fully agree, uh, on the need to carry the debate to the national level, national parliaments. Yes, we are trying to go to all the national parliaments to have the discussion there, at least to the committees. If we cannot get into the plenum, and what you say about workshops, I cannot agree more. We need to to have these fora. We need to find the right fora and make them permanent because only this will establish a rule of law culture. And the, yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, shall I repeat or was it still understandable? Yeah, so just to say that I, I agree, I mean, we, we need to go to the national parliaments. Yes, uh, we do this where we, we try to cover all the parliaments in one year or in two, uh, as fast as we can. Uh, but we also need to have other fora that are more localized. You mentioned the workshops. I agree, we need, we need to find these places uh, where we can come together and where the national stakeholders can come together to discuss. Um, and finally, as regards the uh, the initiative on, on defense of democracy, simply to recall that um, that the commission is, is very much aiming at, a, at an exclusive, inclusive approach. Yeah, there's a public consultation ongoing and I can only encourage you all uh, to engage in that and, 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 and to contribute. Um, and secondly, on the substance, also to recall uh, what, what the initiative is aiming at uh, in the light of, 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 of the, the, the broader context of recent, of recent events. Um, there is basically the aim to, to, to look at lobbyists that work on behalf of, of foreign governments and to be more, more transparent about the, work, about the work there. But of course, we, are, we, are, we, we need to look at the, at the scope and there you also your, your contribution in the public consultation will be very important. There will also be um, a recommendation on, 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 on civic space. And, and that is to recall what, what, what the commission aims at is of course, to promote a vibrant uh, civic space and to promote, uh, to protect and promote uh, civil society. And uh, there are also, so again, um, it's important for us to engage with you and to discuss this. And thank you. Thank you. It should, um, so the directive should be lead in a way that unintended consequences are avoided as much as possible. Um, Just 30 seconds. All right. <laughs> the, uh, um, I think we are, at the agency, we identify needs also with the Article 11, uh, in the Treaty of Functions of the European Union. Treaty on Treaty on your opinion, sorry. Yeah, the treaty is wrong. It's not good. Uh, but to, to have a clear guideline and standards we need to be developed for how communication open and silent and regular dialogue with representative associations and society. Uh, so this would be good if you have that. And then the last one on the protection mechanism for CSOs and human rights events in the EU. Yes, uh, we also identify that there is a, it's lacking and maybe one could consider setting up something like an EU or the other terms of its case. So thank you. Thank you, and I think it was a very good final word because that's going to be the subject of the next panel, if I understand correctly. Um, we have to move on. Uh, I know that there are questions in the chat and maybe on the floor. Unfortunately, we don't have time for those now. And I'm looking at the organizers. So maybe the questions could be answered in the chat, something like that. And with that, I give the floor back to Sasha. Thank you.
Yes, we are really sorry because we suffered a little bit late and then we uh, widened the delay with, uh, we know it's impossible actually. And uh, I think we will learn the lesson that, you know, after this really we have to be given time to tell that story. Uh, lesson learned. Um, it was for me to have a short coffee break in between the two sessions. It's not a networking coffee, just to uh, spread our uh, legs. So please try to shorten it, just grab a coffee and get back uh, seated. And hopefully, if we all do this, we will uh, be able to open in the second panel the discussion with people trying to get up. Human Rights um, and Democracy Network. And um, I would like you to tell us your wish list uh, in front of the many popping up initiatives that we have currently. So what would you hope from uh, the upcoming European Defense of Democracy Pact or from the revision of the European Democracy Action Plan in terms of having more uh, spatial civic, uh, civil society, civic space, but also a protection mechanism? And uh, how do you see also uh, this link to the follow-up work that the Commission is currently doing on the report on civic space. What what is your long list with and hopefully uh it will be heard. Thank you very much. A long wish list in uh, less than three minutes. So we'll, we'll right. see what I can do. Uh, thank you very much. Cool. My name is uh, David Yala. I work at Amnesty International. I'm the uh, advocate for the EU on human rights in the EU. But here today also as the coordinator of the working group that deals with the internal human rights policy of the human rights and democracy network. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in, in the in the in this morning, we uh, we really heard quite chilling and uh, horrifying, frankly, testimonies from uh, from activists and human rights defenders uh, across Europe. And um, we know that uh, these stories, uh, you know, they are they are not alone. They are not the first ones, and uh, we also know that unfortunately they will not be the last ones to face these type of challenges. Um, what we're seeing here, as we as, as I've been said already a lot, like we see more and more uh, criminalization uh, of, of uh, work by by civil society, by NGOs across Europe, um, and uh, sometimes even to the extent of being labeled as terrorists, as as, as we heard this morning. And um, it's also really sad to see that actually the the corruption scandal that rocked the European Parliament and the institutions uh, just recently. Um, uh, also, somehow is being used again as a pretext to uh, to crack down on NGOs uh, even further. Um, we really, you know, need to move away from this negative narrative um, that is of, of, of repression that is basically happening across Europe in way too many places, including here in Brussels. And it needs to be countered by a really positive narrative, a narrative of support and a narrative of action uh, by the European institutions. So in the previous panel, we spoke about the rule of law mechanism, which is a you know it's a very welcome discussion and it's very important. Um, but we really need to speak about the political and practical support um, that that can be given. Um, we we know there are already some things happening. Of course, we're very happy with the uh, having the fundamental rights charter report focusing on civic space and that leading then to the counter conclusions that were very concrete and finally also recognize the existence of human rights defenders uh, in the European space. Um, they were always there. It's just took some time to catch up. Um, and I think uh, you know we also know that there are plans for 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 guidelines, um, just like we have the guidelines for protection of journalists, and that is all very welcome. And this all needs to be followed by action. Um, and to know exactly what action we want to do and we need to do, um, we need to have proper mapping and design um, of the measures of complaints and assistance um, uh, across the board. For a um, mechanism uh, of protection in, in the European space, our wish list um, is that we, we create a mechanism that allows civil society to report on attacks and on negative developments on an ongoing basis. This mechanism should be built on the external uh, experience of Protect Defenders uh, EU and also on the mechanism developed by, by INFA um, uh, to support civil society in external action and on the Council of Europe platform for the safety of journalists, as well as the UN special procedures. And so it's great to be sharing this panel with uh, a number of speakers who will be uh, touching on that specifically, uh, particularly um, uh, Mr. Forst and, and, and Mr. Dama. Um, what such a mechanism is needed for is, is you know, threefold for pre prevention, direct assistance and accountability. Prevention means that we see what's going on, we collect these reports, and it works as an early warnings mechanism 
that can feed into the rule of law reports and into any other uh, action and you know, preferably actual action um, uh, in, the, in the different mechanisms. Direct assistance, it sounds very simple, but it's not existing right now in the European Union, um, is to have a rapid response to support human rights defenders in need um, with a 24-7 hotline that should be run by independent society organizations on behalf of and financed by the European institutions. And assistance must include a range of measures, so, uh, such as legal representation, um, covering medical costs, having protection measures, um, communication and psychological support, um, and uh, where needed, relocation. Um, such a mechanism is also important for accountability, um, because by providing space uh, for member states to actually react publicly to complaints registered, um, uh, they have some kind of duty to, to explain the measures that they are adopting to address uh, the different complaints. It's actually sad to see that the EU uh, uh, at the moment doesn't have also any kind of mechanism uh, contrary to the to the United Nations um, that tracks the uh, reprisals that civil society faces for feeding into European Union uh, processes such as um, the the rule of law report. And um, yeah, I, I would just like to say that I think you know it's it's really great to be here today um, with with this with this panel and with this whole room. Unfortunately, we haven't had the time to hear from the room, but. We are really here um, also with many members of HRDN and our partners, the organizers of this event and all um, and many other uh, groups that provide a lot of, uh, can provide a lot of expertise, experience and ideas for developing such a mechanism. So, you know, we look forward to working with the institutions uh, on, on putting out such a proposal um, and uh, moving forward on, on creating actual protection within the European Union uh, that the human rights defenders deserve. Um, including at the different workshops that are also being planned uh, in the follow-up to the uh, Thumbnet Rights Charter report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for the list. Um, due to our delay, uh, a lot of our panelists actually need to leave uh, before we actually will end the panel. So I will try to do uh, the best I can to, uh, to give you the floor first. Maybe if you can shorten your initial presentation so that we leave a little bit of time for interaction and then get back to you uh, to conclude. So I will uh, immediately give the floor to uh, Erika Del Hellström from the Swedish presidency. You heard our expectations. Uh, and how happy we are to see actual conclusions on civic space. How will you make them last? Already, what is planned to do to give them sufficient uh, force uh, during the presidency, the Swedish presidency, but how can, what seeds can you plant today to make sure that the upcoming presidencies uh, will keep them uh, alive on the agenda? Well, thank you very much. We're also very happy to be here today on behalf of the Swedish presidency, as said. And um, first, just a, a, a short comment on, on why we did the conclusions and, and why we believe it's important. That's just the starting point, very briefly, as I'm happy to leave it. Said. But um, the importance, of course, is of this of, of highlighting the, the crucial role of the civic space as a litmus test of democracy itself. Uh, and the civic space is therefore of utmost importance. So, for us, it was really crucial to, to highlight um, the, the need to, and building on the report of the Commission, uh, highlighting the need to protect, support, and empower uh, civil society organizations and human rights defenders, and to name this in a text that has to be agreed by all member states in the Council. That's also one of the strengths of the Council of the Council conclusions. Actually, all member states have agreed to the Thumbnail's text. And that is, uh, of course, of, of crucial importance when the Union as, its, as a whole continues to, to build on it and to, uh, to take concrete measures. Because of course, as we all know, it's the Commission that has the right of initiative. And uh, this is the member states way of saying what we expect to be done uh, moving forward. And be very concrete then on, on what we can do as the council, as one of the institutions. And of course, the conclusions uh, is a, a clear statement of the political will of the council. Um, we have been discussing already with our with the, the incoming trio partners in the in the next trio um, how to continue the exchange. Uh, one of the steps that have been taken, of course, by the Commission, but that, that we are very much appreciative of, is the follow-up uh, seminars where we are also co-organizing one of them with the Commission. 
uh, and where, which can also continue into the Spanish presidency with, uh, with the conclusion of the, of the series. So I think it's, it's, it's clear already now that the income into here will continue its work on this, uh, on this and, and I think it's also crucial for us to, to really say that the text also gives the clear input that we need to come back to the discussion regularly and to renew the commitment of the council uh, to, uh, to, the, to the scope of the text. So to protect, to support, and to empower to, to every step of the decision that the process, uh, to involve civil society, to listen to the inputs, and to adapt the quality. So I think I will conclude there as to the interest of time, but that's the reason behind uh, what, what we have on here. I think it's also crucial that we continue. Uh, when we move back to, uh, to uh, being a regular member state, we will also continue to push uh, for the inclusion of this agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you much. I think it's, uh, the, the last point that you made is very important because I do think we need champion member states as we need champion MEPs uh, and champion DGs <laughs> to be equal treatment uh, that civil society can rely upon to carry on these issues. Um, I will quickly move on to Chiara Adamo, um, who is uh, head of unit on gender equality, human rights, and democratic governance, and at the Director General for uh, International Partnerships, INPA, uh, and try to learn from you what is the good practice that the Commission has in terms of protecting civil society in external action, and what do you think are the lessons that we should learn, and maybe some uh, mechanisms that we can easily adopt inside, because more and more we see that the defense of democracy and human rights defenders is not only something to do outside the EU, but we really need to do it inside. Can you tell us please a few key points? Yes, uh, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to this event. It's uh, great to uh, also see uh, all faces <laughs> and friends around the room. Um, uh, worldwide, uh, the situation, as, as, as you know better than I do, is, is particularly uh, worrying uh, as we see that uh, the crackdown on civic democratic spaces is really on the increase. Uh, and that comes from all our reports. Um, and as you know, we do support, uh, uh, among others, uh, the Protect uh, EU Defenders Mechanism. Um, if I look at statistics that uh, we were given by frontline defenders uh, in 2021, 358 human rights defenders were killed. Uh, so we are really talking also about an increased violence uh, in the type of threats human rights defenders face worldwide. Uh, and also according to what we see in terms of trends, uh, more and more the killings and the violence uh, uh, is directed towards uh, environmental and land rights defenders uh, uh, with significant proportion in Latin America. This is not to say that other categories are actually uh, on, on safe grounds, but I, I just wanted to acknowledge this. Um, women human rights defenders face particular challenges and obstacles, as you know well, um, alongside uh, LGBTI, and also human rights defenders working in crisis and in conflict areas have their own risks and challenges. Why I'm telling you all of that is because by, from the observation of this reality on the ground, our mechanism, our programs to support externally have become more and more comprehensive. Um, and, and it was really a realization that, um, you know, threats and needs are different. So they also need, uh, this need to, to, be, uh, to be really uh, taken uh, care of. Um, so we have political tools and financial tools. I will be very brief, uh, but essentially, uh, from the political side, uh, we have a robust action plan on human rights and democracy, uh, which really puts the protection of human rights defenders, defenders front and center. Uh, and this reflects in the diplomatic action on the ground, where delegations routinely carry out uh, uh, trial observations, the marshes, uh, they coordinate responses. So this is much then by uh, the support programs. Uh, and we have a dedicated envelope, I know we are the rich guys, uh, Ingrid, uh, of 1.5 billion euros for the thematic program on human rights and democracy. Oh my God. Out of the, yeah, I know. Out of the 1.5 billion euros, 326 million euros, 326 million have been earmarked specifically for the support to human rights defenders. 
Um, so this is done how uh, globally, regionally, at country level. I think for this discussion, the most relevant is probably the global level mechanism. I mentioned, uh, I think our flagship is really the uh, Human Rights Defender Protection Mechanism Protect EU, and Michelle knows well, uh, and alongside some of you, because this is really implemented by a consortium of uh, 12 um, NGOs, human rights NGOs, but partners uh, with the Brussels based secretariat, um, and they really look at addressing short term, medium term, and long term. Uh, uh, the needs and, and challenges. Um, and since 2015, uh, through this program, it was possible to support 58,000 human rights defenders individually. One minute, yeah. So I think that the specificity of this program is that it both, al both allows to support uh, human rights organizations as such, which are under threat, they face, uh, you know, um, um, legal threats, financial threats, but also individuals. And their families. So uh, it's a bit what uh, what you mentioned: the need to provide for uh, legal aid, medical aid, uh, even subsistence at some point, and in order to to, to be able to temporarily relocate uh, defenders when their life is at threat. So that's what uh, we are talking about with this mechanism, which is very much uh, uh, complementary to what we do in house in Inter. We have this emergency fund for human rights defenders at risk. Uh, implemented also with the help of the same uh, NGOs, but uh, it allows us for our delegation to briefly uh, signal cases that need to be uh, expedited. Uh, on a more structural basis, uh, we also have a crisis facility which allows for confidential projects. Take LGBTI activists uh, operating in countries where uh, uh, essentially they would face that penalty. So that's that comes through confidential channels. So the lesson there is also be, we, you need to be prepared to have the tools and also to have projects which are confidential, which ensure that do not harm. Final point, uh, we need also to look at the prevention side. So not only respond when, uh, when the threat is there, but uh, to prevent. So we just uh, ended the call for proposal this Monday for a new early warning uh, monitoring and response system for an enabling environment uh, for civil society. And that would be uh, carried out by a global network of civil society partners to strengthen early detection of sudden deterioration or openings uh, of space for civil society, and also be able to offer brief and flexible financial assistance before the space closes. Because as you know, uh, when there is a bill on a parliament, when there is a smearing campaign, when, when these deteriorations happen, it can go very, very fast. So what, what I think we were missing so far was to have really a mechanism which enable us to have a swift early warning of uh, these, these, these changes uh, and, and be able also to, uh, to, to support in that way. So thank you so much. Um... We will go next to Michelle Fox, the UN Rapporteur for uh, Environmentalist Defenders. Can you tell us a bit of your experience and what do you think it would be needed and useful to, to implement at the European level? Okay, thank you. And um, I would like maybe to, to share with you a few reflections on how I do assess the situation of defenders uh, in EU countries, uh, then invite you to travel to other continents. Uh, uh, to see what has been done in other places, uh, and then end with a, a concrete recommendations for the uh, for the EU. Uh, in my past uh, mandate uh, with the UN as special rapporteur on on defenders, uh, I did organize a series of consultations uh, with defenders uh, in uh, in all continents, uh, and one of them was in, was in in Florence, uh, dedicated to invite uh, uh, defenders from EU countries to meet with me to dis to discuss uh, their situation, their expectations, uh, their recommendations uh, for the mandate with the UN. Uh, and uh, I heard the same thing that we heard today, in fact, from them, acts of uh, arbitrary arrest, uh, campaigns of vilification, defamation coming from uh, public officials, uh, acts of intimidation, criminalization of defenders. Uh, and the conclusion was that the, uh, the, um, the picture was, was quite grim uh, in EU countries. Uh, and the EU, uh, uh, some EU countries uh, were not uh, safe and enabling environmental for defenders. Um, after my consultations, I went to the EU. I met with the parliament. I met with the DG Just, 
say, what can we do? I mean, what could we do? What could we do to protect those defenders inside Europe? Uh, and uh, from I got the message from the EU, from the DG just uh, that something in the making, in fact, um, they had something in the making, but never came to reality, in fact. Um, in October this year, I've been appointed to a new mandate uh, on the protection of environmental defenders. Um, and I did the same, uh, traveling to capitals, uh, meeting with government, meet also meeting, inviting environmental defenders to meet with me. And I hear the same, in fact, uh, what we heard today, uh, that the picture is not very, uh, very good uh, in some EU countries. I uh, uh, don't want to go into detail, but uh, new forms of activism, civil disobedience, uh, environmental defenders being targeted, criminalized, uh, things alike. Uh, so the picture is quite complicated for them uh, in Europe. Uh, we also look at the uh, database that we have at the UN, a database on communication. And if you look at uh, communication sent by special reporters to EU countries, you will see that there is uh, um, some, some concerns uh, regarding the safety of uh, uh, environmental defenders uh, and other defenders in Europe. Um, now, the paradox is that uh, uh, for the EU, uh, the funding is coming from abroad. Uh, we have the Lifeline project, uh, there is also funding uh, uh, defenders in Europe. Uh, we have also a few countries, but due to the uh, ODA, non ODA regulation, they are not able to fund organizations in Europe. That's a problem. Uh, we see that uh, there are already mechanisms, uh, NGOs are doing a lot. Uh, we have the uh, uh, action plan developed by uh, ENRI, uh, the uh, European Network of National Institutions. Uh, Council of Europe is doing a lot. Uh, um, OSCE is also trying to do uh, things in different countries uh, inside the EU. Uh, inside inside Europe, uh, but that's 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 not enough. We need to do more. Now, if we should travel to other continents, uh, let's go to Africa. Uh, we had a similar discussion in the past with Africa at the level of the African Union, and they came to the conclusion that there was also a need to establish a, a mandate. And now we have a mandate in Africa dedicated to the protection of defenders in Africa, doing country visits, uh, preparing report, presenting report at the uh, African Commission on People's and Human Rights. That's a good example. And if you move to the Americas, uh, the Organization of American States, they had a similar discussion in the past. And then they decided to establish a mechanism of a special rapporteur who is doing the same. Country visits, taking cases, uh, is also able to provide concrete recommendations to the court. Uh, to um, uh, decide on, on precautionary measures to protect immediately defenders at risk. When they are at risk, uh, then they can be protected by the, by the court. Um, the uh, EU is uh, also funding what we call the intermechanism meeting, uh, a meeting by which uh, all special rapporteurs dedicated to the protection of defenders meet once a year. Uh, the UN rapporteur, uh, the uh, American rapporteur, the African rapporteur, OSCE is part of the uh, discussion. Uh, INPA is also observing, monitoring the uh, discussions, uh, but we never came to a decision to establish uh, a mechanism for the EU. Now, to conclude, uh, because I know time is short, uh, I have a concrete uh, recommendation. Why don't we at the EU start a discussion uh, to uh, have a decision, a first decision on defenders inside Europe? Uh, and this decision should be based uh, on uh, the UN declaration on US defenders. Uh, with a clear definition that we have at the UN, uh, who are the defenders, and the EU should adopt uh, for internal use uh, the same definition of uh, human rights defenders. And then we could start a discussion using uh, the seven principles uh, that have been developing for states, countries, or regional organizations that want to establish a mechanism for the protection of defenders. We have seven principles that could, we don't have time to go into details, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the link to the uh, seven principles, uh, which are in fact very useful. The second step uh, after a decision taken by the EU would be to create uh, clearly a mandate uh, of a special rapporteur of the European Union on the protection of uh, defenders inside Europe uh, uh, with a clear mandate, uh, including a mandate on reprisals uh, uh, with a clear, uh, funding, uh, a clear budget, uh, a large team would be able to do uh, prevention, but also protection for defenders in, inside Europe. And, you know, to conclude, uh, uh, when I was young, I was working with Amnesty, and we all had a dream. We had a dream to have a, a mechanism at the UN uh, to protect defenders. And the dream became a reality in 1998 uh, with the UN declaration. And then we had a second dream uh, to have a mechanism to enforce uh, this um, uh, this uh, declaration, and it was the creation of a special rapporteur on, on defenders. Uh, why don't we share the same dream for the EU and then make, make sure that uh, by our 
uh, conviction, make sure that this dream will become a reality for defense in Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think if the UN could, the EU can as well. Uh, and we will, we will close the first round with Ingrid Belander Todino, head of unit fundamental rights um, and policy at PG Just. Um, we are not necessarily expecting you to take clear commitments to make this a dream a reality, but why not? In any case, please let us know what is the uh, follow-up phase of the civics paper report that you just adopted in December this year, uh, last year. And also, how do you see the perspectives of the upcoming uh, Defense Democracy Pact? Uh, what is the potential that you are seeing? Do you see also any challenges uh, that have been widely voiced by civil society? And how uh, do you think it will be uh, responded to these uh, concerns? Thank you very much. Uh, my cabinet just left, so I'm, I'm free to say what <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Um, I have the pleasure to be last in this uh, distinguished panel, and, and I will speak from, from the perspective of um, promoting and protecting fundamental rights within the EU, and, and obviously the, the previous speakers have spoken mainly about also uh, outside the EU. And we, we have heard this morning about the the, the political and soft law measures to, to uh, protect the civic space, the rule of law report. We have heard from the FRA, we have uh, heard the, um, the reference to the chart report that we adopted in, in December about the civic space. And very thankfully also from the Swedish presidency, the council conclusions that I, I must say, breezed through the council in the frame rather easily. So chapeau to you, Eric. That was really well done. So there's a, a strong political commitment, of course, to, to um, protect the civic space and, and promote civil society actors and human rights defenders. That's, that's very clear. You have also listed a, a, um, a wish list on actions. And, and I can just say that um, as the UN, the EU is slow. Uh, I was recently speaking in an event about the same, more or less the same topic in the parliament, where someone said that five years ago, we were not even speaking like this. So in five years, we are sitting, and, and I must say it's a very active um, agenda because uh, I'm, I'm actually speaking very often on, on these types of issues now. So it's there, we, we are moving ahead. We have legislation on anti slap uh, DG Grow is pre uh, presenting a, a new directive on the state cross-border uh, association status on, on those uh, to, to have a legal status for cross-border associations. Um, and we will come out with the Defense of Democracy package in, in uh, May, where there will also be an aspect of, of uh, legislation. Um, so, of course, uh, that is... Uh, we're doing everything we can when we when we have the political uh, commitment and instruction to do so. We're also enforcing EU law where there's a hook to uh, few, uh, fundamental rights violations. We take action. We have won a case against Hungary, the the, the NGO uh, financing case in 2020, where the court has really set out the role of. Uh, independent uh, CSOs in our democracies, uh, that they have to have secure uh, resources and work without interference. So that was, a, that was a very strong way of enforcing EU law. We are continuing, of course, we have, you know that we have brought Hungary, we're not gonna point out Hungary only here, but we have just brought the, uh, the LGBTI case to the court now so we are looking forward to more case law by the european court of uh, uh, the, the european court of justice uh, in terms of political uh, um, commitment in the charter report we worked under three uh, pillars so it's the protection the support and the empowerment of the civic space we have heard here and we know the problems so they aim now as Erica also said that we will follow up this report with three dedicated seminars that will start from, uh, we know the problem, what can we do concretely to move ahead? 
we are at the end of the mandate, so we will not be able today and this year to say we will do this, but we will prepare for the next commission mandate. So that is really the intention. Um, we would like to invite you uh, to uh, participate uh, in, in this dialogue and come up with really what, what can we do? What is the concrete actions that can be said? taken and we have heard a lot about that and I've taken note and we know that also from uh, the reports that have been written. Um, moving to the def defense of democracy package. Um, this is a highly political uh, initiative as you probably understand. Um, I must say and you already heard it from, from my colleague uh, here that it's not about uh, foreign agents. It's about transparency. It's to um, to uh, be able to um, seek transparency about any possible foreign influence. But there will be a recommendation on uh, protecting the civic space and the civic uh, engagement participation. So I really invite you to participate in the public consultation that is out now. It will close in uh, April. And uh, the initiative, the different uh, uh, parts of this package is being prepared. It's a very, very complicated initiative. Um, we have many discussions every week now <laughs> in the last few weeks at the very highest level in the commission. So it's, it's something that we, uh, are working on and we're listening and we're taking note and we will take uh, the uh, input in the public consultation into account, obviously. Um, there are many risks, we know that. We know the risk for the civil society uh, and we are addressing those risks and to avoid any undue uh, effects and unwanted uh, consequences of this initiative. Uh, today, I'm not able to tell you what that will be, because, as I said, we're, it's a moving target right now. But um, uh, this uh, package will be also dedicated to the civic space, and there will be elements of protection that we have heard um, uh, in these discussions that will be covered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Uh, I'm quite eager to open finally uh, the floor with the audience to pick up a few questions and then uh, get back to the panel because as I said, some, some of the panelists need to leave. So uh, before going online again, I prefer that we open the floor directly here in the room. We will only be able to pick a few questions. So try to be brief if possible uh, with a question or comment or something that you would like the panel to pick up. Is there any... Body wanting to make a comment, address a question. If not, yes. Hello. Yeah, can everybody hear me? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Natasha from Open Society Foundations. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, I just want to react and uh, make a few uh, comments, questions. Uh, first, uh, really, it's great to have all the, the ex people working on external UN uh, bodies um, and uh, um, council representation here to, today. Really, this is a, a great practice. I hope it continues. These conclusions uh, from the Swedish presidency are very important. We take note that this is the political will of all the member states, and we will definitely refer to them. Uh, it's also really uh, great that the, what was started with the charter reports and this idea of workshops to go to concrete initiatives and measures are endorsed to these conclusions, and hopefully we can design uh, some, some concrete instruments. I want to react to two points. First, and I know we don't want to make this all about this, but when you said in the, that the, um, for, it's not a foreign funding act, but it's on transparency, this was the name of the law of uh, the Hungarian government. Right? It was never called foreign agent act, it was called law of transparency of NGOs. So this is, you know, I, I don't think this is enough to reassure 
uh, as and one point we have made uh, to um, Vice President Jourova when we were meeting with colleagues is at minimum and don't rush this. The contextualization is, is really, really important. Uh, we've seen what has been happening in Georgia. We, we know uh, how sensible this is right now. And um, we were, one thing, we, we, we get your point on the consultation, but what is shocking in the court for evidence is that it says there will be no impact assessment. One thing we would absolutely call for is a uh, fundamental rights impact assessment and an assessment of the risk on civic space. We have experience with similar laws uh, that have had unintended consequences and, and this we should really learn the lesson. This is a call that civil society has been making up since the five years we, we started all this work that every legislation is is looked at, is assessed, uh, looking at the consequences of civic space. And then I just want to uh, add to, uh, to to take advantage that the UN is, um, that we, we heard about the UN system There's We talked about uh, the guidelines and human rights defenders. I think one issue also is what exists at UN special procedures, um, protection against reprisals. And I see as the commission now, um, and has always been, but asking, soliciting civil society to do uh, the monitoring, the work, the assessment of its rule of law work, I and mean, to contribute to the rule of law report, uh, to help with implementation of laws. I think that it's very, it, one idea for the commission could be at least to look at what protection it has to uh, protect against reprisals, civil society in the EU who are working to protect democracy, human rights, uh, and, and rule of law and to implement these values and uh, EU law uh, that, that EU has. Thanks a lot. Is there any other question in the audience? Uh, can we try to be gracious? Also because we're working at the same That's why I'm on this, but I know we've been. I just wanted to also try the importance of the EU is the first national protection mechanism, and I feel that we have been part of the overall protection initiative. Um, and there, of course, I'm also flagging the role of national human rights institutions. In some instances, they can function as these protection mechanisms. Uh, we at Henry are working on that, but of course, in order for any try to uh, be able to do that, they themselves should be independent, thoroughly uh, effective institutions. So it's also called for the Commission to invest in the support of the national protection mechanisms, because solutions can be in the first place and should be in the first place funded at national level. And EU protection is, is like a final resource. Can you please pass on the mic to your neighbor? Here, here. <laughs> Um, hi, uh, my name is Julie. Uh, I'm a part of my Danish organization. I have a, a question for Eric. Um, glad that Sweden will continue their efforts as a champion. But what I really also want to know is we talk a lot about what EU can do for national uh, CSOs or human rights institutions. But what could member states do more instead of just just <laughs> having strong council conclusions and push the, the EU to, to do more, but what could champions do more bilaterally um, to support civil society organization in other member states, to support human rights institutions in other member states and so on. So um, Denmark and Sweden has also a long history to protect human rights defenders uh, via uh, ODA, as was also discussed. So what can we do? more internally to, to push this as well. Thank you. There was one last question here. Oh, there are two of them. I feel like I should start singing right now. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is May Ocampo, Executive Director of Protection International, and this is my colleague uh, Mauricio Angel. As you can see from the name, our, our, our organization's, organization's name, it's Protection International. So it's high on our agenda on how do we make sure that we not only look at the protection of individuals, hum, individual human rights defenders, but collectively, how do we ensure collective protection across uh, nations? 
So that's one of our, uh, per perhaps I'd like to hear a little bit more about what your thinking is around collective protection and how do you pr promote that within the EU and the European Commission. And the other point that I actually would like to highlight is that in our area of work, I mean, thank you for all of the great work that you're doing. One of the things that um, comes to mind constantly as human rights defenders is that when we do uh, legislation, when there's mechanisms to, for protection and prevention, how do we ensure that there's cohesion between all of the laws or all of the legislation that exists? That's number one. And then number two, it's not just about uh, cohesion or the existence of mechanisms. It's also about how is the how do you make sure that the governments comply? And if they don't comply, what are the sanctions? Right? Because we continue, we for many years and decades as human rights defenders, this is one of the areas of work that we've been fighting for decades long. But now I think we need to elevate it to what's the political will, therefore, right? How do we ensure that they're complying and the, and you know if they're not complying, what's the the sanction? Thank you so much. We will get back to the panel for short reactions and then if we have time, if there are one or two more questions, we will also mention, we will get back to conclude. But yeah, let's start uh, again with um, Eric. Perfect. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot for the question and comments. I think um, um, I'll, I'll start with the one we directed directly at me. So, um, of course, I mean, there is there's, there's one role that we sort of ask the president of the council, I think that of course, has to be within the limits of the scope of the presidency, which is uh, to to keep the the, the the issue high at the political agenda, and that in itself uh, sends signals, it forces administrations to it forces or encourages, depending on how you look at it, of course, um, to to discuss it internally. What are our viewpoints? Uh, are we in line with with with, with these soft law texts, if it is, for example? Um, and then, of course, when it comes to uh, to, to to checking. Um, if, if we're actually if member states are in line with uh, with uh, EU law, it's, it's it's the Commission that's the, the guardian of the treaty. So uh, they are very much uh, encouraged, also of course, by member states to, to continue to do so. Um, so. So when it comes to the to the more the, the harder side of the enforcement, bit, it, it is not the Council; it is the uh, it is the Commission. But uh, so what we do is to keep it high on the agenda. I think that's really important as the President to do. Then what can member states do uh, as champions? I think it's really important also to to make sure that things are discussed because when discussing it, it's, it can't be hit under uh, the carpet. It really has to be uh, discussed. That's one thing. The other thing is, of course, um, in, in in member states' external action to to make sure that there is support uh, across the board and to ensure also negotiations in the EU when it comes to funding programs, for example, to make sure that the so EU funding is available uh, for civil society across Europe uh, because that's of course of crucial importance uh, that there are funding programs from, from different actors from the government itself uh, across the EU. So those are some of them, I'll get briefly. And, um, and I think really some of those things uh, already respond also to the question of how to make sure that the governments comply. And the other thing I think is also, as you said, the cohesion uh, between different legal acts and, and legal things. It's, Really important. It's actually touched upon, I would say, in the text that we have from the conclusions. Also, the, the importance of at, the, at all stages of decision making processes involve a wide array of actors, including civil society, including other actors which are experts on different fields, and to make uh, and, and don't make make a link between different things. But it, for us, it's important with impact assessment. No, <laughs> no notch uh, in, in another direction, but uh, that's to make. It's also a position of the council to council conclusion that. Fundamental rights uh, impact assessment should be uh, conducted uh, as much as just. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Let's go on with uh, Chiara, Michelle, and then. Uh, and maybe uh, I will pick up on a couple of the uh, remarks. One was about the role of the NHRIs. Um, and uh, there is to bring maybe the experience for, again from the external angle where uh, we have a long standing partnership, we are supporting. Uh, both the global uh, and the various regional uh, um, of the NHRI's uh, um, networks, including NHRI EU. And uh, I think it adds value on two fronts. The first 
is that we through that uh, through those networks we can really re uh, support them to have the capacity to um, reach the uh, you know uh, Paris principle independence standards etc. So uh, we inject um, the added value that the networking can provide. But secondly. Uh, the NHRIs of course play an important role as defenders of human rights defenders and uh, more and more in a number of countries are HLDs themselves. Um, so second uh, that I wanted to pick up was uh, about uh, the member states uh, also uh, to, I mean, you probably know that, but a number of member states, they have developed their own uh, protection mechanisms for human rights defenders. Once again, I believe this is more for defenders who are outside the EU. We were together with Michel Forza at the launch of the Marianne Initiative from the French, but there are many others. And for us, it's important because, of course, member states, they do, they can provide um, uh, visas, they can provide uh, Asylum, um, so it's, it's, it's very complementary to what uh, the EU level uh, can do. And last word on uh, from protection international, protection international. Um, I make example of the individual support because that's what we are talking about, but of course the vast majority of what we do is supporting organizations and uh, enabling environment for civil society organization. We also have another dedicated thematic program for the civil society program, which is the dedicated to pro support CSO as actors of governance. Thank you. Uh, a few words on, on replies, because that was a question raised by, uh, by one of the participants. Uh, clearly, we have at the UN uh, a strong uh, mechanism of reprisals, but it's only dedicated to those who are speaking to the UN. Then uh, the uh, Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights in New York has the possibility to raise the case. Uh, with member states and to explain why uh, that should not be uh, replicated. Uh, and there is an annual report prepared by the SG uh, on reprisals. And if you look at this report, you would find a few uh, countries inside the EU uh, for a name, I don't mean name precisely because they have been uh, doing um, acts of retaliation against those who are speaking with the UN. Uh, uh, Catherine, on, on national laws and mechanisms, uh, yes, uh, together with the, with a group of NGOs, we have developed uh, a sort of um, uh, model law uh, for states that want to create a, a national legislation on the protection of defenders. And uh, at the end of the law, there is a, a specific recommendation to create a mechanism because without enforcement mechanism, the law might be inactive. And in many countries, like currently, uh, that have passed the law, uh, you have a mechanism, and in most of the cases, uh, that's precisely the national institution, which is the mechanism in, in charge of uh, implementing the uh, national law. And if we think at Europe, uh, you could also think that uh, maybe uh, the fundamental rights agency would be a sort of uh, NHRI for Europe and could be also entrusted with a role to play in the protection of defenders uh, if the EU would decide to pass a sort of legislation on the protection of defenders. Uh, and lastly, on collective protection, that's for me a, a very important thing. And collective protection, as mentioned by uh, by Protection International, it's it's also about protecting communities, uh, uh, protecting uh, uh, indigenous people. And uh, traveling into Europe now, uh, I'm meeting with uh, precisely indigenous people in the northern of Europe. Uh, I'm meeting also with local communities that come with a sort of complaints saying that we are uh, left without protection as a community. So we need not individual protection, but more collective protection. And that's something that, that we also uh, should uh, keep in mind. Thank you. I will, if you don't mind, this is not the over. And then, uh, thank you very much, Angel. Yeah, I, I think I, I just uh, really like to come back to, um, to some of the things that, that Angel said. Uh, I think really, um, indeed, we know that the EU is so. <laughs> Um, and, uh, um, and and that we are that we are catching up. I think um, the fact that we've been talking so much about this in the last years, um, starting with us from civil society and then being picked up uh, by the EU, is simply because, of course, the well, well, the institution made it so the rate of attacks on on human rights defenders um, is uh, at very high speed and, uh, and and needs needs urgent attention. I mean, there are cases uh, like, like uh, uh, Sean Binder also indicated this morning where cases are um, intentionally held 
uh, for a very long time to, to be slow and to keep that uh, uh, horrible black cloud hanging over people's heads uh, for a chilling effect for others. Um, but at the same time, uh, in other instances, uh, things move, move much, much faster. And um, we understand that really the development of, of uh, legislation and, and new funds and, and all of these things that they, that they take time. And uh, I definitely also want to just uh, say word of appreciation for the work of your unit, um, also, also Alessia, and, and, and the great things that you do um, um, onto the space. Um, but we really need also the, the hierarchy to catch up and to act faster, particularly when it comes to cases such as Justina, uh, who spoke this morning. Um, you know, we had we had very loud reactions from the European Parliament, uh, including an immediate press conference the next day. Uh, we had a joint statement from from UN special rapporteurs, um, but the silence of the Commission uh, was deafening, really. And um, um, it's it's not the only case, but it's uh, it's it's the most recent one. Uh, that we can point out to. We know there are all kinds of complications around competence and uh, abortion rights and that it's sensitive, uh, but we're talking about a woman human rights defender who's standing up for women's rights and who's being um, criminally prosecuted in a European member state, and that just cannot pass. Um, so I think that is something that does not need to take time and actually can be done very quickly. Uh, it's only there is a political will. I know that doesn't depend on you, but <laughs> Um, I just want to uh, want to state that here. And the same on the on the case law. I think indeed the the Hungarian case law was was very very important. Um, and uh, we also look forward to more case law. And to see that case law, we need uh, more cases. Um, and uh, we have the usual suspects, of course, where there are really really serious developments that are very clearly uh, um, indicated and that we all talk about. But uh, there are many other countries um, that are doing great things <laughs> that are not in line with the law. Um, and I think uh, also, again, uh, Sean, Sean's uh, presentation this morning was very clear on that point, um, connecting um, this type of case directly to the rule of law and to the um, So, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just to add a layer on the notion of connected or connection that has been developed, because I think indeed it's important to, when we think about the protection mechanism and the language also that we use, let's remind ourselves that, of course, what do we mean by human rights defenders is in the wide sense, all those individuals and organizations that work to defend human rights in their daily action. But just to, be, to pay attention that if we use this is quite narrow language for a lot of organizations that are doing this, but they don't recognize it. They think, they think oh, this is the work of Amnesty uh, International and so on and so forth. So let's just uh, wide through the scope and try to do two rights defenders and recognize everyone who is fighting in the wrong sense. And I'm giving the floor now to Dr. Indri. Thank you. Um, I think that it's quite clear that we are uh, working in the same direction of different speeds. Uh, we are working in a political context, but rest assured that the people in the commission who fight for fundamental rights are doing their best. And I'm not sounding it defensive, but I, I really want you to trust that we are working uh, for, for uh, protecting and supporting the civic space. We also have the legal service. We have very clear case law. So there will be safeguards in place for the uh, defense of a democracy package. So um, I want to assure you that uh, your fears, I understand the fears, I understand the, the worries, but we will make sure that uh, everything is uh, done according to the, the legal framework and the case law of the court, uh, court in Luxembourg. Um, about the impact assessment, again, this is, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's fast. So uh, we're, we're working now to get this done within this mandate before the European elections, tapping into the, the, to the commitment of the European Parliament uh, to hopefully get the directive that will be proposed adopted before the end of this mandate. So that's uh, why there will be not time to do a proper better regulation impact assessment, but there will be an assessment there is an assessment of fundamental rights implications and implications on uh, this civic space. So there's a, this mini uh, impact assessment that we are doing. So it's not something that we just take out of the air like that. 
Um, I think it's important, I forgot to mention it also in my previous comments about funding. The EU funding is complementing the member states funding and under the CERB program we have dedicated funds that have now uh, been slightly simplified hopefully for uh, grassroots uh, organizations. I know you know, <laughs> we're trying. Uh, we're trying this new way of, of uh, sending uh, grants through intermediaries that is supposed to be a, a, an easier and more straightforward way to fund grassroots organizations, which cannot exceed uh, member states funding, national funding. So it's a way of, of doing that in a more uh, pragmatic way. We set aside last time 50 million for that. It's nothing compared to what no, we have in the interval. You can do it. But we will have uh, have that as well in in the next call. And there are other funding streams available. So just to say that there is uh, support also at the EU level for this. Um, then I, I think I'll stop there. Um, thank you so much for having invited us here. Thank you so much. Please stay just a little bit longer because, of course, we are not done. Uh, we, I mean, I know that this is not this is why I want to come back to the panel, but in case I can stay, I stay that would be really helpful because I want to give the floor also and thank you, Michelle, for your contribution and Chiara for being allies. Uh, I'd like to give the floor now um, to um, Dennis Gilding from OSP because. To explain a little high on the agenda of OEC, and uh, I think that it is very important that from many, many uh, directions we, we really try to learn from one institution or another. So please, very shortly, tell us a little bit about the first OEC uh, level of the research. Thank you very much. Uh, if I have only two minutes, I have a good taste of something about what we have learned from the mechanisms. On legal protection existing in the uh, 38 OECD countries. So, as mentioned, um, we have recently published the first OECD report uh, on civic space, and it's a very uh, broad concept that we apply uh, on civic space. But what we um, learned when we looked at legal protection for human rights defenders in the 38 OECD countries. We learned uh, broadly four things. Uh, first of all, we uh, stressed the importance for countries to recognize their dual role uh, in protection. So, in the framework of development corporations as well as in their own jurisdictions. Secondly, it is crucial when we talk about protection mechanisms within countries that all relevant state actors assume their respective role. And that the center of government, uh, supported by line ministries, leads this uh, process of creating a protection mechanism. Thirdly, um, so in order to understand and meaningfully respond to threats um, of uh, on human rights defenders in their own territories, governments uh, need reliable and disaggregated data. So this includes a broad range of data, and it also includes data on threats and attacks, data on slap, data on hate crimes, and data on prosecution counter impunity. What we've seen in our research is that work on this is very special in the OECD countries and uh, that where political will is lacking is up to CSO to assume this role, but in order to gather this already existing data alongside one another, Governments must uh, create strong partnerships with institutions that have a role to play in monitoring. And here we are also speaking about law enforcement agencies that can provide data on other criminal statistics, such as hate crimes, uh, national statistics officers, national human rights institutions, here's also the hotlines that have related data on complaints that can also be uh, incidents. And last but not the least, um, all the latest programs, strategies, and laws uh, to protect human rights defenders must be uh, developed with civil society uh, and effective persons so that they need real uh, protection needs and in real time. So I invite you to look into our report. Uh, we have a little highlight for sure as well because the report is very long, but um, I think you can also reach the parts of it and dive into the future. Thank you. So uh, I know that we are very much behind schedule and I apologize for that again. Just Virgil wanted to say, no, Virgil is done. 
we did have two, and I, I don't want I, I want to do justice to those that uh, said or provided that they, they would like to make a short, short contribution. So we still have online Thais from Nova and uh, Dutch and Red Europe. I'm sorry, I don't know if you know your name, even if you had Pixita, if this is, uh, I apologize for the pronunciation. So please can we connect shortly and please be very, very short in this then and really conclude and share together a lunch and network and continue the conversation. Yes, please, please. Uh, sorry, Thank who is Thank speaking you. first? I think me, I speak first. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tuxita. Okay, thank you for, for providing us with this space. And we try to be as concise as possible, as some issues have been already pointed out. Uh, since 2015, we have been working in a network from NOVAC with different organizations and movements in Spain, developing protection tools for political participation, uh, particularly regarding uh, the right to freedom of expression and the right of peaceful assembly. So I'm talking from this perspective. In this sense, we have been detecting different actions necessary for an effective protection of what we consider not only active civil society, but also defenders of human rights in Spain and so in Europe, as some of you already said before. On the one hand, uh, the need to influence the transparency and accountability mechanisms of the state securities force because there is no public access to protocols, guidelines for action, or internal instructions that regulate the use of force and weapons of the Spanish police. Moreover, usually police officers in, in Europe as well are not correctly identified. This makes it difficult to clarify responsibilities in cases of malpractice and encourage even impunity. Also here, the Spanish ombudsman's power is limited when investigating police actions. For that reason, we are asking for the creation of an independent and external body for reporting malpractice and police control with powers to effectively investigate complaints and reports related to the use of force by the police. On the other hand, mm -hmm. uh, I want to point out the need to continue fighting for legislative changes and make it coordinated at the European level because what happens to us related to security and anti-terrorism laws that are affecting civic space will happen to others in Europe or are already happening. So this is connected to our demand in Spain to refrain from targeting harassment and criminalize of youth organizations, housing organizations, not only a person that is already set on the room, but also the organizations and to refrain from surveillance which has been used as a pretext to unlawfully prosecute and create a shilling effect amongst political dissident groups. So in this sense, we need to continue having the European advocacy channels active, open and regular with actions on national parliaments also. It is important. Uh, it's important was already pointed out before in this morning, but but I think it, it's great to, to focus on it. And last but not least, <laughs> uh, direct support to civil society for self-protection, mm -hmm. that was already said before, but knowledge and networking, and, and for us, this is to facilitate resources for the development of more enduring tools and systematization of human rights violations in a national level. Also to increase uh, the creation and know-how spreading of networks for the observation of rights and uh, to promote the growth of support groups and mutual support alliances among civil society to improve interconnection, to make interdependence visible and thus to create again this feeling of belonging to defense and protection of, of the rights for all. And that's all for our side. I, I guess I try to sum up everything. I hope Thank I don't talk too, too fast. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thais. And uh, let's go to Pichita, and then we will really wrap up and go to lunch. Hi, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Dikshita Aganesan and I'm from Transgender Europe. Uh, TGU is a membership-based organization with over 200 members from 48 countries in Europe and Central Asia. 
Uh, so trans activists and organizations are facing serious challenges and threats from a number of anti-trans actors who are working systematically to undo many decades of progress. For the better part of the last few years, the capacities of trans groups have been stretched as they've had to respond to humanitarian crisis while being heavily targeted. This has important implications for our long-term ability to function and to advocate for the individual and collective rights of trans people. For individual activists, there's a real concern of physical and online safety. Trans activists are at the risk of being doxxed online and intense social political context at the risk of hate crimes, violence, and harassment. Organizations also face constant threats from different angles, including the physical safety of their officers and staff, threats to funding being cut off, online attacks and name calling. A number of our members have been attacked in the very recent past, including having their venues trashed, offices vandalized, and as well as physical attacks. Their financial and passport information being revealed online and being branded as foreign agents. Many of our members have also removed their locations from Google Maps as a precautionary safety measure. So this is the context in which trans activists are working at the moment. Uh, organizations need to be strongly supported by funding that includes lines for core support, well-being and security so that we can shore up our internal security systems, institute safety and security measures and invest in holistic security and well-being of staff. We also need strong legal protections through anti-discrimination measures that protect gender identity and gender expression, hate crime laws, cybersecurity legislations to protect the online and offline identities of trans people. Most importantly, authorities must receive sensitivity training. So, uh, and finally, I would say that we need tools by which we can monitor and document the threats and attacks faced by trans activists and organizations separate from a criminal law standpoint. An example of a recent good practice is the development of a new website in Germany oh, where yeah. organizations and individuals can report attacks that they face. And... Ah, uh, okay, I didn't want to cut or anything, but I, I was just saying that you have very few time left. Uh, yeah, I was done. So please, please conclude. Ah, you're done. Okay. I'm really sorry, uh, but we we risk uh, uh, remaining, you know, an empty room because we are really uh, very much preconcerted. So thank you very much. I think beyond, uh, you know, what is possible to be done under the current version uh, of the European Commission um, and what is possible to integrate in the defense of democracy, back, I think it's also important for you people in the European Commission to hear constantly these testimonies because this, in, in this way you really can, can have a, a touch up, a touch ground with the, what's happening uh, out there in Europe. And also to keep in mind that if we want to defend democracy, well, in the first place, I think we need to enact the democracy and we need to make democracy relevant to the people. Uh, we do this and you do this through policy. Uh, and also you should look at us civil society as important allies not only to respond to public consultations, I know it's obsessional, but we always constantly get back to the issue of civil dialogue. Yes, consultations are useful, but we need really structured dialogue with civil society that has, you know, takes the pulse of the society itself, as you have seen through this exercise. So we really want to play again for this. Again, plant a seed on this so that we, we can have something to take up in our for the advocacy with the new commission in place. And last, lastly, yes, we need to defend democracy from foreign interference, interference, but we mostly need to defend and enact democracy inside the house because there are a lot of threats and to defend those that enact and defend democracy. I think these messages have been heard here today in the room. We know that we can count on you. And we are also heard that there's political will in the council and let's hope this will all unlock a lot potentially in the coming months and years. Thank you so much and let's join for for life.